very first video I'm making for this channel. However, I have been running uh, my board game website for over a year now. And that website is called thinkoutsidetheboard.com. And to date, I've been focusing on two columns that I've been publishing. The first one is called Previously on Kickstarter. And that is designed to be sort of a grab bag of everything that came out the previous day on Kickstarter or uh, on a Monday, the games that came out Friday and over the weekend. And not every game makes it onto that list, you know, because I try to do some amount of curating and, you know, not include things that are someone's get rich quick scheme. <laughs> or something that's just kind of been slapped together and is really unprofessional. Um, there are kind of a whole laundry of list, list of things that I look for it to make that list. Um, but I really try to get most things that have some effort put behind them on it. And I, and I really try to make sure it's not just, you know, the big companies. It's not just Queen Games or Waken Realms or Simon or, you know, I, I try to get the smaller, more indie stuff in there as well. Um, like I, I had, um, um, Cristalo was up there and not only was Cristalo on that list Cristalo actually made my other column which is called Kickstart This and Kickstart This is, is a much more kind of specific recommendation of uh, games those are designed to be um, games that I'm recommending where if I had unlimited funding I would be backing everything that, <laughs> that is in Kickstart This so the one column is sort of a grab bag, like here's everything that was out on Kickstarter yesterday. And, and if you want a very easy way to look through a laundry list of stuff, see if there's anything that you like on it. Each entry lists um, like the developer, the, I mean, not the developer, the designer, the artist, the publisher, uh, the game mechanics, um, the kind of minimum pledge amount, the maximum pledge amount, not including add-ons, um, just the pledge levels. Uh, it gives you a summary of the game. It tells you if it's already funded or not, or if it's, you know, where it is in funding. Um, and usually after 24 hours, you have some idea if the game is going to fund or not. Like it's either funded or it's well on its way, or you can kind of tell that it's not going to fund. And I have some other things, things in there, like I tell you the complexity level of the game, number of players, um, the kind of risk that I think is involved in that game. You know, and that's usually dependent on whether this is a first time, you know, someone's doing this for the first time, or whether it's a company that's done this a lot. And, and sometimes it also has to do with the game itself, right? I mean, a game that's just a very cheap card game um, is going to be, there's, it's a lot less likely that something can go south on that than some huge, huge game with all these miniatures and boxes and boxes of stuff. So that's what I've been doing the last year plus. And I've actually been lucky enough to be able to kind of been doing that full time. Um, but I want to expand on that. And I want, I want the website to grow, you know? And in some ways I'd look at something like uh, Heavy Cardboard, which I think is fantastic. And a part of me thinks, Kurt Cobain kind of famously said, I'd be very happy to just be a Pixies cover band for the rest of my career. You know, if Nirvana had not blown up, I kind of think like, ah, I'd, I'd be totally fine if I was just kind of imitating heavy cardboard. Um, but that's not where we're starting. And I think if we end up somewhere near there eventually, it'll be different because our journey will be different. Um, the first step of that journey was to be podcasting. But of course, I'd planned to add that to our you know stuff and implement that before COVID-19 took the word world by storm. So I kind of bought it, gone out and bought all this uh, sound equipment and had begun setting it up and, you know, learning how to use it with the idea that I would be, you know, filming in person. And I had a rotating list of co-hosts. I was going to do four podcasts a month with three co-hosts. So one of them was going to do two, like two, two of the four gigs every month. Um, but we were going to film live and in person and probably maybe do video of it as well. And obviously that's not happening right now. <laughs> that's still in plan. Uh, like still, the plan is to do that later. Like we'll get to that. But for now I've had to pivot. And so here are our videos. And 
over the next month, I'm going to be experimenting with five different types of videos. So this is the first of those five types of videos. And let's call it a monthly update for now. So because this is the first one, I'm talking a little bit about myself here and some of my plans for the, you know, for the website and kind of introducing myself because it should be done, right? But after I finish that, we'll get into the, I guess, the meat of this video, which is the monthly update. And uh, future months, we'll have a video like this, but not with me rambling as much in the beginning. And then I'll be doing four different kinds of videos, four other videos. One of them is going to be a teach, and the first of those will be for Seventh Continent. The second one will be a narrative playthrough, and this is something I see as, as an ongoing series. And the first one of these will be for Seventh Continent as well. So if you guys like the first Seventh Continent playthrough, maybe I'll do more of those. Maybe I'll play all of Seventh Continent. And if people don't like Seventh Continent as much, and they tell me so in the comments, maybe we'll move on to something else. Too Many Bones, or Tainted Grail, or Mansions of Madness, or Dragonfire. You know, there's a lot of things we could do. Um, the third type of video that I'm going to be doing is an impressions video, which I see as sort of a review, but instead of just saying, like, this is a great game, or this is a terrible game, I'm going to focus more on the positives and the negatives of each game, and also, like, who's the game right for? Because... Certain people may like a certain genre of game. So if you like a worker placement game, maybe it doesn't have to be a 10 out of 10. You know, maybe a pretty good media <laughs> worker placement game or a mediocre worker placement game are still a good game for you. So in my impressions videos, we'll be talking about that. The good of a game, the bad of a game, and who it's for. And the last one will be, I guess, an unboxing plus. I've been considering calling it you know, red carpet premiere or something like that because I'm not just I'm not just like punching the game and filming it. I'm not just opening up the box. Um, there won't be a teach in those kinds of videos. I won't be going heavy into the gameplay, but I see it as a way that I can kind of let um, you guys see something that you might be considering buying at the store, and it's kind of like you're opening the box and you're getting to look inside it and see all the components, see the way it is on the table, kind of see the way it'll function without like a full teach or anything. So that will only be done with games that are either have just arrived from Kickstarter or have just released into stores. So games that are kind of new to me, if I'm like, oh, I just bought a Feast for Odin and it's new to me or it's new to my collection, that will not qualify for this. This is games that are new to the world, whether the Kickstarters have just gone out or it's just, you know, hitting retail. Uh, so those are the five types of videos. And I'm going to start out making one of each of those this month and we'll kind of see how it goes. We'll see. I, I imagine I'm going to learn a lot in the first month. I'll be learning editing. I'll be learning, you know, I'm going to have some music uh, for these first videos. We'll see how much I like that or if I want to tweak that. And we'll, you know, we'll throw everything up against the wall and we'll see what sticks. So let's get started with the 13 games I've played in the last month or two. First up, Seventh Continent. Now the Seventh Continent, um, I, it was probably my first big box game that I bought. And in, in terms of big box game, meaning like just lots of stuff. And I've always been a fan of like, big narrative campaign video games and things like that. So I thought this would be a great way to see how that works in the board game world. But when I when I wanted to get Seventh Continent, it was already uh, past the point of the Kickstarters. So I kind of had to wait for a while for late pledges to open up. So I, I got it after the fact. Um, and then once I got it, it's a beast of a game. <laughs> and... Um, my fiance was, I think, going through brain surgery, so we weren't really going to start it at that moment in time. So we just finally got to it fairly recently. Um, and I love it. I mean, I love it. <laughs> There's one thing I could say about The Seventh Continent, which is a little bit problematic, um, which is that especially when you're playing um, the Voracious Goddess, which is designed as sort of like the intro mission 
in the base game, you really do a lot of your exploration of the island in that mission. And I think by the time you've, or a curse, it's really, it's called a curse. I think once you've solved that curse, you're gonna know the island well. And when you go and play the other curses, it's much less a case of exploration than it is, okay, where do I go on the island to do this thing that I need to do for this curse? Um, but that first curse where you're kind of really exploring the island and mapping it all out and seeing what the puzzles are and how you can solve the puzzles and how you can hunt to get food to be able to you know extend your play you're kind of figuring all that stuff out it's, it's very exciting and i love it um but my one caveat with it that i think people should know going in is because it's a long mission and you are exploring the whole island and it goes over so much of the game you're going to get to a point where you've done a lot of exploration and you've depleted your life force a lot and you've solved a lot of puzzles and you get to like let's let's say for the sake of explanation that the game runs from point a to point z so like let's say you've progressed to point q um and then you die you got to get back to point q and getting back to point q is going to mean doing all those things all over again now you may be able to do them a lot more efficiently but because it's such a long trudge, you still may not have that much life force when you get to point Q. So you may, you know, do a few things, try out a few, you know, solutions to puzzles that you thought in your head, and you die. So you realize, okay, that's not going to work, that's not going to work, that will work, but now I have to get back to Q again. And so you're doing a lot of kind of repetition, repetitious playing. And I think that's the one downside to the game. I, I don't think it's going to be as bad once I get into future missions, because I think at that point, as I've said before, you're, I'm already going to know um, where to go and, and what to do and what does what. Um, but in the beginning, there is there is that kind of repetition that happens. I, I, don't, I almost want to call it roguelike, but nothing's changing. It's not like a video game where everything's kind of randomized. Like the path is still the same. You just are having to redo it quite a bit. Other than that, it's a great game. And I don't think I'm going to say any more about it right now because I am going to do a teach and I'm going to do a playthrough of um, what has now been sort of recommended as the a, a good intro mission. And it came in the big expansion. Um, I think it's called the Crystal, the Crystal Song Curse. It's a much shorter mission. And I'll be using the playthrough to give you guys a taste of the game. Um, using this kind of crystal curse mission and also maybe maybe solving that little tiny starter island just to kind of you know if people are I don't want to spoil too much but if, if someone's at this point doesn't have the seventh continent and they you know are thinking about jumping in this will give you like a little bit of a taste of how some puzzles get solved there's also one specific mechanic in it um, that is very it's not mentioned well enough, I think, in the rule books, uh, which is that there may be hidden numbers on some of the cards. And if you're playing this first mission and no one really kind of communicates that enough, you're not going to be able to finish the mission. <laughs> you may be sort of bypassing these cards and not seeing this hidden number and playing something over and over again and losing over and over again because you you forgot or you didn't read the bit about the the hidden numbers and so i think as an intro player um it, it it's a you want to know that you want to know that you don't want to waste time doing this mission like 10 times and just not seeing something so when i get to it the uh the the kind of gameplay video for that is gonna is gonna feature the the starting uh, island as long as well as the crystal song curse and give people a little bit of an entry point into the game. Next up, And Then We Hold Hands. So And Then We Hold Hands is a, is a co-op game. And I thought my fiance would really like it. It's, uh, it's a little bit of a meta game um, because it's asking you, like the, the theme of the game, it's an abstract game. So you're kind of pushing around um, little glass circles 
on a, on a board that kind of has like rings with like dots of color on the rings. And you draw cards. And as you play cards, you kind of, you can move along the outer ring. And the types of colors that you turn, that you, uh, that you move along also kind of, they determine like your point on the sliding scale. Like one side is green and blue colors, one side is red and black. So if you're moving on an equal number of red and black and green and blue, um, you will stay in the state of equilibrium, kind of right in the middle. I'm trying to illustrate a sliding scale here. So you'll stay in the middle. And as long as you've stayed in the middle of the sliding scale, you'll be able to draw up more cards at the beginning of your next turn, which is very important. Um, if you don't get to draw for one, you know, one hand, not a big deal, but if both you and your partner are doing multiple turns where you can't replenish your cards, you're going to lose the game. Um, so you, you need to get, you need, you need to be in this equilibrium spot in the middle. And then as each time you get a third of the way through the deck, you're allowed to go into one of the tighter concentric circles. Uh, and then at the very end of the game, you kind of have to both end up in the, uh, in the middle and you kind of have to make sure you're doing that with the right number of moves to get you right in. But the sliding, <laughs> the sliding thing also needs to be in the middle. So and there's, there's hand management. There's kind of some coordination with your partner. Um, there's a little bit of efficiency of actions, um, but it's, it's just a really good collaborative abstract and we both liked it. So I, I, I heartily recommend it. The only problem is it's, uh, it's out of print. It took me about a year to kind of track down the game, and I ended up being able to buy it secondhand off someone I knew. But if you ever get a chance um, to pick it up and you like lighter, abstract, collaborative games, you should do it. Azul. That's the third game that we played. Um, I really like Azul. I love Azul. For, it's one of those games that I think if I'm going to have some lighter games on my shelf, I want one of those games to be Azul because I can teach it to anyone very quickly, and yet the choices in the game still have consequence. And for those of you who don't know, uh, Azul comes with these really bright, chunky tiles. Um, you, there are also these little coasters. You put a certain number of coasters out on the, on the table. I think it's maybe the number of players plus one. And then each round you're filling each of these coasters with, I'm just gonna call them coasters because I can't, that's that's the name <laughs> right there. That's what they're called, but I'll call them coasters. Um, you put the tiles on the coasters and then on your turn, you get to take all of the same colored tiles from one of these coasters. And then the rest of them go in the middle of the, the, middle of the uh, table. Now you have these kind of player boards that you're filling out with tiles and the player boards are structured so that, you know, like there's five rows. This row has one space, two spaces, three, four, and five spaces. So if you take a certain color of tile, you have to put them all in one row. You know, so if you have three tiles and your little row with three spaces is open, it's great. Put them right in there. And then at the end of the round, you will move any tiles uh, over to your scoring area that are in a complete row. Uh, if you have incomplete rows, those will just kind of hang out and stay like that until the next round. And you're trying to score in the, um, I'm physically trying to like explain this for you, but you're trying to score in the, the scoring area and you get certain kinds of points for completing uh, columns. You get certain points at the end of the game for completing um, all of, if you have all of the same color all filled out in the scoring area, you get points for that. And you also get points when you complete a row, but when someone completes a row, it ends the game. So the only way someone's going to get multiple rows is if they do something to kind of like complete multiple rows all at the same time. And that's, that's probably my one caveat for Azul, is that the game can be very, very fast if someone just goes and finishes a row really quickly. And that could be good, that could be bad. Um, if no one else has scored any points at that time, that person's going to win. Um, it, it does mean that however you're scoring on points, you have some agency in when the game ends because someone just needs to make a row. So if you're kind of like, if you know you're up on points, you want to make a row and end the game. If you know you're behind on points, you want to make some more columns, get some other colors out on the board, and uh, then finish a row. 
And the other part of the game that's interesting is when all those tiles are in the middle, if you take, you have to take all of one color. So you could get ha you get stuck, and this has happened to me before, you get stuck taking like 10 of one color, which isn't gonna fit in any of the rows. The longest row has five spaces. So all of that overlap, overflow is gonna go into this, the bottom of the board and give you negative points. And I think I had, I had one game where I got like negative 40 points because I just kept getting stuck every game with like large numbers of tiles that I couldn't fit anywhere. And um, I, don't, I, don't, I personally wouldn't call that a negative of the game. It doesn't bother me. I thought it was funny when it happened, but I guess you should know about it because you could have some very, very low scores. For me, as I said, the only negative to the game is just the fact that you know completing one row ends the game, which could make for some very, very short games. And uh, I suppose first-time players could, you know, not even knowing they're doing it or forgetting about it, they could end the game very quickly, you know, right as the game's almost, right as it's begun, and, and kind of not really known that they do that. Um, I think my fiancé did not love Azul as much as, as, much as I like it. Um, but we'll see. I have a feeling we'll play it again, so we'll see if that, you know, that opinion stands. Uh, next up is a game called Blitzkrieg. Now, Blitzkrieg is a war game. This is one of three games that I played online in the last month or two during isolation. And it's it's a light game. Um, it's a war game. I think it's called World War II in 30 minutes, or I can't remember if it's World War I or World War II, but it's one of them. And it has, the board has five different um, areas of combat. And each one of those areas is a different area control battle. And you kind of need to multi-manage all of these areas at the same time. Because you might, you could be, you know, kicking butt in one area, but your opponent may be doing, they may be kicking butt in another area. So you're kind of, you're multiple, you're um, managing all five areas. And then each area has kind of three different levels. And so as you place tiles in one level, you know, once everyone's filled out all the tiles, then you can go to the second level. And um, certain things give you points along a sliding scale. So it's like a tug of war, where if you've got more points, you'll get majority. If your opponent gets more points, they'll get majority. And it's simultaneously against all these five um, arenas of battle. And I liked it. It was a solid game. I probably wouldn't buy it because it's just, it's a little, the combination of being a lighter game and it being a war game is not something I would probably pull off the shelf. Um, but it's a game that I definitely would play if it were presented to me. And I probably will play it again online. In fact, I find online places like Tabletop um, Simulator, Tabletopia, Board Game Arena, those are really good places for you to get your fill of a game that you like or you like well enough, but you probably wouldn't buy. And I know for me, for example, I probably will never buy Terra Mystica. You know, I have a friend who has it. I can kind of get all I need from it on Board Game Arena. And at some point I'm going to buy Gaia Project because I think for me it's a little bit more interesting of a game. There's a little more going on to it. I like the variability of it. A little more and I see no reason to own both games so I'll be buying Guy Project at some point and then I'll just get my fill of Terra Mystica online. So there are definitely times when an online platform can really kind of supplement your, your gaming or your gaming collection. Cat Lady. Now Cat Lady is totally what I want from a lighter game. Um, it's got great components. They're really all these chunky wooden pieces. Some of them are little cans of tuna. Some of them are, um, you know, there's like chicken legs. Um, and the card art is fantastic. It's, it's very attractive while being simple. And it's just, it's a, it's a card selection and um, set collection game. And you've got a kind of a grid of, a grid of nine cats in the middle of the playing field. And you're either taking all three cards in a row or all three cards in a column. And then you put a marker on that column or on that row, and then your opponent can't choose that row or that column on their turn. And the reason for that is that way it keeps 
um, it, it makes players kind of have to choose from the whole board. They can't just keep taking the same role over and over and over while certain cards get stale. So <clears throat> it's a great um, little mechanic. Um, and the components, as I said, are fantastic. Um, you're trying to get cats. <laughs> you're accumulating cats. And then you also need to have the food to feed them at the end of the game. If you have a cat at the end of the game and it doesn't have the food that it likes, you don't score the points for it. There are also some other cards that give you um, other kind of set collection bonuses, but it's a well-designed, simple, small, uh, easy to take with you, full of great choices, just great game in a little box. Like, this is what, what I want from these types of games. So, and my fiance loves cats. She loves the art, she loves the components. It was a big hit. Next up is Century Golem Edition, which this one has a little story behind it as well. I, I first got the Century games. I played Century Spice Road, and I thought it was a neat little game. But I bought Century uh, Eastern Wonders. I mean, to me, that kind of had deeper gameplay, I, and I really liked Century Eastern Wonders. And then I learned about the Golem Editions, and I didn't want to jump on it because I, I thought, you know, I'm this guy who likes experiences and I want to get all three games and be able to play them together. And so I need to get all the games with the same theme. And at the time that they were saying um, that the, they weren't going to make Golem Editions for all three games. So there's Spice Road, there's Eastern Mountains, sorry, Eastern Promises, I think was originally the name, and A New World. And they later kind of reversed and they said, okay, we are going to do the Golem theme for all three games. I think originally the Golem version of Spice Road had been done as kind of like a convention extra, but it became so popular because it had such great art. And people loved the Golems. Uh, and so they decided, okay, okay, we're going to mass produce this and make this available to everybody. And then everyone started saying, well, we really want all three games in the Golem theme. And so eventually they relented. So, which means I had to sell my, my Eastern Promises because that means I was going to, if I'm going to get all three games and I want to get three games that are themed with a theme that my fiance will really like, I wanted to get the Golem Editions. So buying the Golem Edition uh, for Spice Road was kind of me restarting. So I, I ditched Eastern Promises. I picked up Golem Edition of... Uh, Spice Road, and I got the playmat for it, and I also got the playmat for Eastern Mountains. And I plan on picking up Eastern Mountains, which is the Golem version of the second game, as soon as it hits, uh, you know, regular game stores. And um, the company that produces it, Plan B Games, they have been doing a thing where um, Eastern Mountains was only available through their website for a year, but they're not going to do that with the Golem version of New World which means that the Golem versions of the second and third game will actually probably hit game shells fairly close to each other, and I'll, I'll be picking both of them up. So Century Golem Edition, or Spice Road, the first games in the series, are definitely the simplest of the three games. It's, it's, a, very, very, it's a very simple game, um, Spice Road, or the Golem Edition. Um, but again, it's a game that... I don't think we'll leave my collection. Um, it's just got fantastic components. It's got these really nice silver and gold coins. Um, the card art is great. I've got the mat now. The mat's beautiful. Uh, the gems that you're, you're, it's sort of a, it's kind of a cube pushing game, but instead of cubes, it's gems. Um, the gems are like these, you know, they're fantastic. They're very tactile. They look great. You like to touch them. And they have these, in the Golem edition, it comes with these little cups that kind of all fit in the in the tray in the box and there's spaces on the mat where it shows you where they go and it's just it's a beautiful game um, but it's a simple game all you're doing is uh, taking a card each turn um, if you don't want the first card you can put down uh, gems and then take a later card and if you take an earlier card later in the game when someone else has kind of put gems on a few cards to get the card that they want you also get any gems that have been placed on that card. Um, so you're kind of, you're collecting these cards. Um, you're sort of creating a deck building hand in a way. And as you play the cards, you know, they go down in a discard. And then you have a card that allows you to kind of pick them all back up as a turn. 
So on your turn, you're either getting one of these cards, one of the Golem cards, or you're paying out resources to get one of the end game scoring cards. And when you do that, uh, when you get a certain number of those, it triggers the end of the game. That's it. Yeah, it's a simple game. But it's fun. <laughs> it's colorful. And it's got great tactile components. And it's got valuable choices to make. You know, it's not, it doesn't play itself. Um, so again, it's, it's a keeper. It's a, a never get rid of, or a never seller, I guess, in my opinion. Um, and my fiance like liked that one as well. So Cat Lady and um, Century Golem Edition were both big hits. Um, Deadline's a little bit of an interesting beast. Deadline I really liked. Um, Deadline has a little bit of a narrative element to it because you're solving cases, and there are 12 cases. And you kind of, you could kind of play through all the different cases, you know, quickly if you wanted to, one after the other. You'd sort of be done with the game at that point because the cases do have answers. You know, you're you're trying to, with your partners, it's I think two to four player game, you kind of match symbols. It's a hand management game. So you, and you're trying to put cards down to match symbols that you need for a location. And if you do that for a location, you solve the location, you get to flip the card over, you find out some information, and then you go to the next location. So in a given game, you're trying to make it through however many locations there are in the game. Let's say 20 locations. If you, you know, fail a certain number of times and in different ways, take damage, kind of, you, you could die and... Um, then it kind of forwards you to the end of the game. And at the end of any game, you're kind of doing a quiz on the on the, the case. So your ability to solve the case and answer all the questions correctly depends on your ability to get through as many of these locations as possible and get all the information that you possibly can. So it's possible you could do it missing several locations. It's also possible that if you miss several locations, you could be missing vital information. Um, but that's that's all the game is, right? It's very simple. You're, you're matching icons, you're solving cases, but everything is, it's printed. You know, it's set in stone. So once you know the answers, you solve the case, that's it. There's no replay value. Um, the only way there could be replay value is if you put the game aside and come back to it in a couple of years and don't really remember it. And they've said that they would eventually produce more cases, but the base game's been out for a couple of years now, and I nothing else has come out, so I don't know if more cases are really happening or not. Now, initially, my fiance and I really liked the gameplay of Deadline. Um, we liked the very simple matching of the icons and trying to uh, complete all the different scenarios and to get all the information that you need to finish the quizzes. And the first time that we played it, we did the first case, and we solved it completely. We answered all the questions, we got everything correct, we aced the quiz. We didn't play for a while. Um, I actually took it to a meetup group and kind of hosted it, so I wasn't actually playing it. I was just teaching it to four other people who were playing it. I did more of the narration of the cards, but I was kind of fulfilling almost like a dungeon master role. Um, and then it was a while again before we went to play. So I want to say almost a year had elapsed. We actually went back and we replayed the first case and we handily beat it again. I think I remembered a lot of it, but my fiance didn't really remember too much of it. Um, and then when we got to the end, all the clues and solutions made sense. And within a couple of days, we moved on and we played the second case. That case has me a little worried about Deadline in general because we ended up through some fantastic uh, feats of gameplay. We did complete all the locations and it didn't seem like we were originally going to be able to do that because we had some bad luck with cards early on. But we kind of came from behind. We managed to complete all the locations. We had all the information from that case. And I think you do need to have, if you're, if you're, if you're constructing a game like this, you do need to have, like, you shouldn't necessarily be able to ace the test just from having the information. You should need a little bit of deduction and inference to kind of put some clues together and figure things out. 
right? But if you have all the information, you have all the completed clues, you have all that information in front of you, you should be able to have all the answers and, and correctly answer the questions. And the way that the clues and the solutions were constructed for that second case, uh, that was not necessarily the case. So we had all the information, we still couldn't really effectively answer the questions. And I think once we knew the answers, we could kind of backpedal a little bit and figure out how they got there, but it wasn't very clear from the cards. There wasn't necessarily uh, a concrete solution the way there was with the first case. Some details were a little more open to interpretation. And that does have me worried for the rest of the cases because I did really uh, initially like the game. I liked the gameplay. I liked the simplicity of it, the matching of the, um, the icons and the solving of the cases. But if it's gonna be a case with future uh, case files where you're gonna play through it, you're gonna solve it completely, and then you would even have to go back and replay it because you would actually need information that you gathered from the questionnaire and the correct answers themselves to effectively answer the questionnaire, that's not gonna really work for me. Um, so I'm curious to see how the other cases hold up. Um, I do have a few other games that are similar in, in terms of uh, solving cases. I have a Detective, a modern uh, crime board game, and I have, uh, I backed the most recent Chronicles of Crime Kickstarter, which is the one that has three separate games that take place in different time periods and they're kind of connected through a family lineage, which looked fascinating. So when I was originally trying to decide between the Chronicles of Crime base game and Detective, I did my research and I decided to go with Detective. But then when Chronicles of Crime had this uh, Kickstarter for kind of a new evolution of their series, I decided to jump on board and back that. So I will have those two games to play with and compare Deadline to, and I'll have to see eventually as I, as I play Detective and once Chronicles of, Chronicles of Crime's uh, Chronicles of Crime delivers its Kickstarter, how everything, how those three games compare. But it does have me a little worried for Deadline, and if I find that that is a continuing issue with future cases, I will not feel badly about kind of busting through all those scenarios, quickly playing it, and then selling the game. Excavation Earth is the second game I played online during uh, isolation. And the reason that I played it online is um, I've been considering backing the Kickstarter. I mean, the game's still not out yet. The Kickstarter just completed recently. And it's a game designed by David Turksey, who I like a lot as a designer. Um, but I'm not 100% sold on all of his games yet. <laughs> you have some convincing to do, David. But I like a lot of his games. And um, he's co-designed several of my favorite games with the Mind Clash team. Um, incidentally, in that period where I was a little lukewarm on David Turksey, I ended up backing two of his big games that month, um, Excavation Earth and The Defense of Procyon 3, um, which are both really look neat in different ways. Um, but I was originally not sold on Excavation Earth because at heart it's just a, it's a set collection game, and it's, it's a heavier game, as I tend to like my games but it's still a set collection game. Uh, now, I, I, I got to play it, and it, it won me over, uh, piece by piece. Starting with the design of the game. It's just pretty. It's a very pretty game. I like the art, and I like the graphic design. I like the components, and I like the theme, which seems to be that the players are alien races who have come down to Earth after humanity has gone extinct and we're plundering earth for artifacts for relics and there's a few different ways you can do that you can it's, there's some worker placement going on where you're moving around the board and you can kind of take um, artifacts from different uh, parts of the the board but there's also this whole uh, market system um, which is almost like something in the gallerist or even lisboa where you are trying to sell some of your goods. Well, actually what happens, you, when you take a good, you can take a sample from it. 
Um, and so you're accumulating samples for the end of the game, and the samples will score in set collection ways, you know, based on rows or uh, columns of the samples of the items. So there's that mechanic. But there's also an area of control mechanic that goes along with um, how you've actually sold, bought and sold the artifacts themselves. So you can acquire them on Earth. Um, my faction had an ability to be able to sell um, an artifact to a place where they didn't have a presence. And because you can sell, you can sell in multiple markets at one time, I was always able to sell, well, for most of the game to three markets, which is really a tough uh, feat to pull off. And there are uh, bonuses the more markets you can sell to. So it gave me just a crap ton of points. Um, so I, I did really well. I did. I, I think I played into my faction's ability better than my friend June played into his. Um, and I, I kind of slaughtered him in the game. And so I think I enjoyed it more than he did. And that may have all <laughs> contributed to my, my really enjoying the game and backing it. But I, I did really enjoy it and I did back it. And I look forward to playing it again when eventually the Kickstarter is delivered. Kanagawa. Now, Kanagawa is one of two games that I have that are almost the same game. And I think I'm eventually going to need to sell one of them. The other one is Bob Ross, Art of Chill. And they're, they're painting games. Um, they're games, they're lighter games that have to do with uh, set collection. Um, I, I, I like them both. Actually, I really like them both. Even, even though um, the Art of Chill was like a Target exclusive my fiance and I both really like Bob Ross. Who does not like Bob Ross and his happy little trees? And the game, that game is surprisingly for this, you know, kind of very mass produced target exclusive game. It, it, it's fairly well designed. You know, it's not that complex a game, but it has things going on. It has choices to make. And um, it's, it's fun. It kind of captures some of the, the theme of Bob Ross. There, there are little things in the gameplay mechanic um, that emulate Bob Ross very well. So I, I don't know if I want to sell that game. But I also really like Kanagawa. Um, and in Kanagawa, there's more of a Japanese flavor to it. Um, there's like this bamboo mat that you use to put cards out and take card selection um, from. And then you're either using the cards to build kind of like a painting mural across the top of your tableau, or you're placing them on the bottom and creating... Um, kind of like paints that are available to you and abilities that are available to you. And then at the end of the game, you're going to score based on, you know, different groups of icons and pictures that you have on the top, um, based on the kinds of weather. There are a few different scoring mechanisms. But we played it, again, we played it a year or two ago. We, played, we both really liked it. So I think it's going to stay around for a while. And uh, I look forward to playing it again. <laughs> Next up on the list is... Papillon. And this is the one game on the list I am going to pan. I'm going to pan this game. And it hurts me to do that because I don't really want to pan many games. But the game has a lot of production problems. And it's themed around butterflies and flowers. And like some other games that have come out recently, like uh, Wingspan or Everdell, there's some really cool stuff that you create three-dimensionally with you know, thick cardboard. The problem in Papillon, because you build these flower bushes and you're sending, like, there's an area control thing going on where you're sending butterflies to different flower bushes and you clip them on with these little, tiny little uh, paper clips. And there's these, the, the butterflies are attached to the paper clips. And everything about the construction of the game is so fragile that when I, I borrowed the game from a friend, he'd never actually played it. And just out of the box, so many of the butterflies had already come off of their little paper clips. Some of them came off of their paper clips just while we were playing. Sometimes I'd just pick up the paper clip and be holding it and the butterfly would just fall off. Or you'd go to put it on the little, you know, far the little flower bush and the butterfly would just fall off. And it's 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 sad a little bit because the game it looks gorgeous, and the idea behind it is is solid, and the kind of area control and set collection 
is well done, as well done as a lot of these other games that I'm talking about. But the production quality was so poor, I just couldn't recommend the game to anyone. And it made me glad that I didn't back the Kickstarter. And I feel bad saying this because I don't want to, you know, crap on on anybody's game company, but they really need to go back and fix this game or do a second version of it with stronger components because they, they could have a winner. But as it stands, I, I can't recommend the game to anyone. I think my fiance didn't even want to finish it. Multiple times she asked to stop and I just kept saying, let's just finish one game. Let's just, let's just finish it so we can say that we played it once so that we can have a, you know, a, a complete idea of the game. And so we did, and then it immediately went back to that friend. Um, yeah, so I'm sorry, but don't play Papillon. Not unless it's fixed some point down the line the, uh, with the components. Next up, the Rat Catcher. And, oh, I lied. I lied to you guys. I played four games online. <laughs> so this is the third, and the reason I didn't remember it with the other three is I played this one solo. And I played this one because I was looking at the Kickstarter for my website. I didn't know whether I wanted to recommend it or not as a kickstart this. And it was, it was easy to find out because I could just go play it solo online, and I did. And I haven't done too much solo gaming on my own. Um, I think I'm more likely to just go play a video game if I want a solo game. But there are some games, like Lacerda's are my favorite games. He's my favorite designer he was until until the mind clash team won me over um but his solo uh the, the solo versions of his games are usually fantastic and david turksy does a lot of solo stuff for the mind clash games and other games he, he's kind of created the side niche uh or niche as like a, a solo game designer and he does fantastic solo stuff so i'm becoming and also, I like narrative campaign games, as I've said. And a lot of those you can do solo. And um, sometimes it's hard to get a group of people together. So, you know, I may end up playing a lot of Seven Continents solo. You know, playing multiple characters. So I think solo board gaming is, is going to slowly win me over. And certainly right now, right, while everyone's isolated, I think a lot of people probably have, have found solo gaming. Um... But with the Red Catcher, the thing I was worried about with that is that it was going to be very fiddly, that you were going to be moving a lot of pieces around, and that apart from all that fiddliness, there really wouldn't be that much game to it, uh, or much replayability, that you would just kind of be dealing with a lot of fiddliness and then kind of doing the same thing over and over, no matter how different the game was. So I played it online, and I think there is that amount of, like, there can be repetitiveness in it because you are pulling the same cards. There are the same mechanics. But not in a way that would ever prohibit me from playing it or make me not recommend it. Because I, I thought it was a really, really good solo game. And if the game was still on Kickstarter, I would tell you, you know, if you love solo games, go back it. Um, so what I'll say right now is if, is if it's still got a late pledge manager thing Go check it out. You are this weird steampunky rat catcher in a steampunky world, and there are several different characters to choose from. They all have um, some different abilities. There are several different kind of um, boss rats, and then there are several other um, kind of sub-boss rats. And you can have any variety of those things. The tiles, the floor tiles are gonna come out in different orders. And then there are enough just kind of general mechanics throughout the game from your weapons that you're using and upgrading to the different techniques you're using on the rats. Um, you can use kind of food to keep them busy. There's some things you can kind of throw out that isn't food but looks like food that might kind of keep them busy. There's a lot of variability within the game that I don't think you're going to really ever feel like, oh, I'm so tired of this game, I'm just playing the same thing over and over. And the artwork and the components, um, what I could tell from what I've seen on the Kickstarter and, and the way it is pictured in the uh, online version, they're great. So the Rat Catcher gets a huge recommendation from me. 
I don't know if I want to play that one again online. I kind of want to play the, uh, the, the physical version. So maybe at some point I'll see about getting that for myself. Uh, Rome. Now, Ryan Laucat, I'm really excited about. Um, I think he's in that middle area um, where he's a game that both my fiance and I, like, we'll both like his games. And we've played um, Near and Far. We've played Rome. Um, I have some several others of his kind of on the way from Kickstarter. I'm really excited about Sleeping Gods. Um, but I love his art. Great art. And Rome, Rome I definitely backed for my fiance because it was a smaller box, simpler game. And again, Rome is what I really, really want from a light game. You're just, it's, it's a card selection thing. Each player starts with three kind of character cards. And each of the character cards has like a pattern on them. And then there's kind of a pattern you put out of, of land cards. And you use one of your character cards, flip it over, and you put gems on the location cards um, in the same pattern that are on your character card, the, the symbology on your character cards. And each, each location card has, it's divided into a grid of like six squares. So like, let's say you have like a little, a little L shape on one character. So maybe it's like you have a square here, a square here, and a square here. So you need to place gems out in that same pattern. So you flip over the character, you place the gem out on a location card, and if that location card has, you know, a grid of six squares, you're gonna fill three of those in. When when each location card gets filled up, whoever has the most gems on it will win the card. And they'll take that card, they'll flip it over, and it's a character. So it's a new character. Now you have, instead of three cards, you have four characters. For anyone else that had presence on that location with one of their gems, uh, they'll get a coin. Just one coin, but they'll get a coin. And coins can be used for a couple things. Um, points, generally. But they can also help you um, fudge your way through the placement of things in different ways. Um, some of the characters have like an invisible square on it. And in order to place on that, it's like, it's like a dotted line square. So in order, if you want to use that square as well as your character's uh, regular symbol, you have to pay a coin. Or I think it's two coins. Um, but that's all you're doing. You're just you're using these characters to place gems, to get more characters. And then once one player has like 11 characters, the game's over. You get points for the values on the characters and I think the coins. And you can throw more stuff into the game. There are a few kind of little mini expansions that add some more uh, complexity and variability to it. But it's a great game. It's simple, has good choices, has gorgeous card art, nice components. It's, again, it's a never sell game. Um, it will stay in my collection probably forever and it's great. And it's easy to teach, it's easy to get to the table. The last game that I will be talking about in the I Played It section is War Chest, and this was the fourth game I played online, the third game that I was thinking about. Now, War Chest is a war game, sort of. It's also an abstract game. It's also a bag building game where each player has a certain number of these very tactile, chunky, attractive plastic chips, and you're, you're throwing them in your bag. And I think it depends on the player count, um, but you're going to get a certain number of units of a certain type. And I think like if you play with two players, you're each getting four units and you're each getting two of each of those four units. And then you get a, a ninth disc that's kind of like your player disc. You throw them in a bag and then you're, you're drawing out discs every turn and then you use them on the board. And the cool thing is it's very asymmetric. So every, if I'm starting out with, with four different types of unit, each unit is going to work differently. And it's unlikely that my me and the opponent I'm playing against, I can play a two-player game. You can play up to four. Um, but everyone's going to have different kinds of units. Like no one's units are going to function the different way, the, the same way. So there's a high degree of variability in it. And um, it's just you're, you're trying to figure out the efficiency 
for the way your units play. And you're also trying to do smart things in how you bring out your units. For instance, um, you need one type of card to bring out your unit, but you need that same type of card if you want to bring out another type of the same unit to kind of bulk up that unit. Like you can never have two of the same unit in play separately, but you can have multiple units of the same type on each other. And that way, if your opponent attacks, you only lose one of them. So it kind of gives your, your unit extra health. And you also can use that same, I said card, but it's really chip. You can use that same chip to um, move your unit. So you have to make choices. Do I want to, if I have two of the same type of chip, do I want to strengthen the unit or do I want to move the unit? And then there's the kind of, you know, there's an area control because you're trying to gain control of certain spots on the board. Um, but you're also trying to figure out how, like, how your units work well with themselves, with each other, and against your opponents. Um, so, and it's, I think there's a little bit of a barrier to entry with War Chest because you really need to know how your units, I mean, how your opponent's units work. And you won't necessarily know them as a first-time player because they'll have they'll have their cards in front of them that show what the what the units do. But you won't know that. And so you're, you'd be looking across the table trying to read upside down what their units do. Whereas if you've played the game a bunch of times, you'll know how their units work. But it's a really good game. <laughs> and I think because of all the variability of the unit types and the way that they work, it's going to reward players who play a lot, learn the units, and there's going to be a lot of fun of discovery in that. So I would I would very much recommend War Chest. I, I wanted to say I don't think I would buy the game because, again, it's, it's not really my thing. It's this kind of lighter game, and it's a war game, and it's abstract. But I think I might actually. I think I might actually. Like, it's a good enough game. I think it may have overcome you know my it not being like in my sweet spot so those are the 13 games that i played best games of the last month on kickstarter um, most of these i think have already ended their kickstarter uh, campaigns so you probably can't pledge them although if you're if they look really attractive to you you can always like go in with a late pledge assuming that they allow you to do that i mean not all campaigns allow you to do that after the fact. Sometimes you have to do that $1 pledge to get access to the pledge manager. So I don't have all the answers for you. <laughs> I'm just going to tell you some great games that I think you should be aware of that were on Kickstarter last month. And then we'll go to the games that are going to be new this month that I think look like the cream of the crop. And these ones you can definitely get in on. Anyway. Last month, and this one is one of the ones that's, as of now anyway, this is still up right now. It has, at the time of filming it is anyway. It's, it's called The Age of Atlantis. And it's by a few guys. Um, I, think, I think two of the three who started the company or have worked on this one. Um, their first game was called The Island of El Dorado. Not to be confused with The Quest of El Dorado. Those are two very different games. The Quest of El Dorado is more of a race game, kind of a deck building hand management race game. Um, Island of El Dorado is something else. Island of El Dorado did not do, I mean, it did okay. It funded on its first Kickstarter, but the people who received the game, I heard a lot of talk that it was broken, didn't work really well. They did a second Kickstarter. Um, they seem to have fixed a lot of the gameplay issues. And then they did a couple other games. They did one called Windward, which looked really cool. And you were on these kind of wind ships, and, and wind movement could change um, around. It would change kind of the movement of your wind ships. And they followed that with a game called Capone, which looked really neat. It had these kind of like cardboard speakeasies, and each player would have a speakeasy. And it was kind of a trading negotiation game. And uh, you know, obviously around like illegal alcohol in the whatever, 1920s, 30s. And it looked really neat, but I didn't back it. The Age of Atlantis, I think, I'm going to caveat this by saying I'm not backing it because I can't back everything. <laughs> but the Age of Atlantis is the game that I think 
could be the game that kind of like really takes them forward to the next level. It's a worker placement game. It's a civilization game. Um, if you go online and you look at the Kickstarter, it's got these some really chunky building kind of wooden components, kind of like the buildings in Scythe. And it reminds me of Scythe in, in that way. It's also got these it's dice, and some of the dice go on little plastic pieces. You don't roll the dice in the game. The dice are used kind of as counters. And in that sense, it reminds me a little bit of some of the dice in Feudum. Uh, but it's just got attractive components all the way around. The, gourd, the, the board is beautiful. The components, um, the buildings look great. The dice look chunky and great. Um, and the player boards remind me a little bit of Scythe as well. You don't have, in Scythe you kind of have two player boards and you use one action to affect the other action. That's not happening here. It's just one player board, but it has an unlockable tree skill set. And so as you build different buildings, uh, you have different abilities within those buildings, and you can build different of the or you can activate different of the abilities in different eras of the game. And some of the abilities have different levels, so you kind of have to build the first one to then build the second one. So I like all of that design behind it. Like I think it's very cool. Everything looks great. Um, yeah. So that's a game from last month that you know that that came out in June that had my attention and that I think should have your attention. Another game is Canopy. Canopy is a very light game. Um, I'm generally not in the market for super light games, so this is not something that I backed or you know would be backing. But for a lot of people, this would be a great little set collection game um, that's going to be easy to teach and that you can kind of pick up and take with you on the go, smaller box. Um, canopy, basically you're building up uh, trees in the rainforest and you're going to score points based on how, um, how big you build your trees. And then for the type of canopy that you put on top, it kind of create, uh, acts as a multiplier. But then there are like four other things that also give you scoring possibilities. There's like uh, wildlife, there's animals, there's plants, um, and there is weather. And so between all that stuff, you have a nice um, variability of scoring possibilities. Um, anyway, Canopy, it just ended. It's from, uh, it was published, it's being published by Weird City Games and designed by Tim Eisner, who does some stuff like the, he did the Grim Forest um, and March of the Ants, which I really would like to pick up at some point because that looks like a really cool uh, civilization game that's kind of built around insects um so yeah but canopy if you're you know if you were looking for like a great little light uh card selection um set collection game looked like a good one another lighter game i didn't personally back fire tower this was for the uh, expansion rising flames but you could also get the base game through it fire tower just had such a cool theme um it took place in like i mean the board has um, I guess it's it's in like a, a foresty area. Um, there are fire towers on each of the four corners. So each player uh, has agency over one fire tower. And then you're using the, the, the very cool gems that represent fire in each square. The, the board is kind of like a big grid of squares. And the goal is to try to spread this fire to burn down your opponent's fire towers while protecting your own. And some of it can be done um, through a win mechanic in the game that sort of happens randomly. Some of it can be done through choices that you make as a player. You can throw water on areas of your own fire tower to put it out, but it's kind of a one-time thing where if you do that once, you can't do it again. It's always nice when games have something like that, but it's also, uh, you don't want that to be something that a player can rely on constantly. So it's a one-time thing, and you do it once, and then then your fire tower is much more vulnerable for the rest of the game. But you know, it's a, essentially kind of an area control game. But I just thought the gems, little fire, the gems that represent the fire looked very cool. I think they're the same make as some of the gems in Australia, colored differently though, and the theme is just really cool. I haven't really seen anything like that before. Next up is Intrepid. Now Intrepid. I thought looked very, very cool. It's a cooperative game. 
My only critique of Intrepid is that it looks a little, like the tiles and some of the design of the game looks a little dry. Um, I think it doesn't look like some of the games we've been talking about, like Cat Lady, have components that really pop, you know, that sort of like beg you to play them and beg you to touch them. Um, Intrepid, not so much. Like the tiles, you know, have this kind of font that looks like maybe Courier, but it just looks kind of like a very basic, non-sexy font. And there's not kind of much art on the tiles. So it's not the prettiest game in the world, but I like the theme behind the game that you, all the players, are astronauts uh, from different countries. So it's kind of an international team of astronauts working together to kind of solve these terrible crises that happen in a space station. And it's also, it looks complex enough to me in terms of each player having kind of agendas that they need to fulfill that I think it would prevent against uh, any one player being like an alpha gamer. Um, it looks pretty meaty and, and pretty heavy. Um, but the way that the challenges are kind of divided between what you have to do and what you have to do as a, as a group, I think will keep people working together very productively and positively and collaboratively. And so it's a game I'm really excited to play. The, the art kind of kept me away from backing it this time around, but maybe I'll get another chance you know, later on if, if it does well and they do an expansion down the line. This is the first of three games in June that I actually did back. And this one's called Merchants of the Dark Road. And I was really excited about this one. First of all, it has, um, has art by Andrew Bosley well, and Matt Paquette. Andrew Bosley did the art for uh, Everdell, which fantastic card art. And he also did the art for uh, the card art for Tapestry. And it's cute, it's clever, it's bright, gets your attention. Uh, and so I knew, like, the art was going to be great. But that's not all. <laughs> it also is designed by Brian, I'm not sure how you pronounce his name, S-U-H-R-E, Sewer, Sure, Sewer. Ryan Soar. And he has done a couple of games that are very much on my radar, uh, Coldwater Crown and Freshwater Fly. And if you look at Freshwater Fly, it's got a player board that kind of duplicates a fly fisherman's reel. And there's a really kind of neat rondelle thing going on that um, simulates, you know, the fly fisher's reel. And it's just, and the design behind the whole game just looks so kind of clever and well thought. It's, you know, I, I thought I should have both these games already in my collection and I don't. And this is a director I, I need to get his games. So when I saw that there was a new one coming out and it had art from Andrew Bosley, also from Matt Paquette, who do, uh, did Called Adventure, Mystic Veil, vale, uh, Thunderstone Quest, which I own in Tiny Towns. How could I not back this game, right? And it's got uh, an interesting theme, which we've seen a little bit, which is that players are merchants who are selling to adventurers. I think there are a couple other games out there that kind of do that, where you're not the adventurers, but you're you're catering to the adventurers. But I don't have any of them. And this game to me just looked very clever in the way that it did it. So each player has kind of a wagon of goods, and you're also kind of going around this board, you, you have a little wooden meeple that's like your caravan. And when you're going around the board, you'll always have access to two worker placement spaces. And I like that. I like the fact that it gives you kind of some variable variability in what you're doing. Um, and you're also kind of dealing with your wares and your stocks on a player board that represents um, this kind of traveling cart that you have. So there's that aspect of the game. But then once you get the goods, you need to go and sell the goods. <laughs> and you go to a different part of the board, and then you're kind of, there's a, almost a different part of the game where you're trying to sell the goods to different adventurers. And I just, there's kind of so much going on mechanically, and that's one of the things that I like when there's just a lot of different stuff to kind of juggle, and, and the game kind of becomes like, how do you juggle these mechanics together? And from everything that I've seen from, from Brian Sewer before, I have faith in him.
uh, you know, so I was, it was an easy insta back for me. I was very much on board with this one. And also, the, the, I have gotten um, like the brass game, so I have iron clays, which iron clays are these fantastic coins. And everything today seems to like want to throw in a metal coin. And I feel like I don't really need to get all those metal coins because I have some great ones that I can use for most games. But the coins from Merchants of the Dark Road are some of the coolest coins I've ever seen before. They're, um, let's see, they're called the Lumi coins. And they're kind of like these plated coins in like multiple colors. They're really neat. So I don't think that this Kickstarter is still running, but you can go and check it out and see the coins. And, you know, maybe it'll be something that you want to grab when it comes to retail or in a future Kickstarter campaign. Next up was Monumental. Um, the African Empire's expansion campaign. Now, Monumental is something I thought about back in the first time around, like a year ago. And I was a little put off. I mean, I didn't pull the trigger. And I was a little put off from pulling but the trigger at just the cost of this game. Because it came in two versions. One was standees and one was miniatures. But each version, I thought, was very expensive for what it was. So it's kind of like, do I want to spend all this money on the miniatures version? No. Well, okay, I could do the standees version. And then once I looked at the price of the standees version, that seemed expensive for what that was. So I ended up not backing it. But the game looks pretty damn good. And I'm really excited by it. I really want to play it at some time. And it's not going retail, Tal. It's never going retail. So I guess I'll have to back it on a future Kickstarter or try to buy it from a friend maybe at some point. But it's a civilization game. It's also a deck building game. It's kind of a dudes on a map game. It's an area control game. Um, you're using a deck building mechanic to then build a nine card tableau. And the cool thing that it does, it's very specific to Monumental itself, is that you're essentially kind of tapping a combination of row and column, you know, like, so in a game, you're literally getting five cards activated every, you know, every round. You're getting a column and a row. Of course, there's one card that they're going to have in common. Otherwise, it would be six cards, but there's an overlap, so you're going to have five. And then those five cards will generate resources, give you some abilities, and then you'll apply those onto the map where you are um, putting your dudes, <laughs> you're putting various people on the map, you're moving them around the map. And I think there's a lot of exploration early in the game, in the first round or two. And at that point, you've kind of built this, built out this modular board and you kind of explored most of it. And then later in the game, you're doing more fighting. But there's so much in this game that I liked from the deck building to this very kind of unique nine card grid and kind of how you tap that along with the civilization aspect um, and just the modular board and the, and the dudes on a map stuff. So I didn't, I didn't back it. I would love to back it in the future. It's just kind of a case of finances and how much you want to invest in any one game and what else is out there at the time. And, you know, I had backed the previous month, Nemesis Lockdown, which is a big one, and Kemet, which was not small. And uh, some other things. So I didn't really want to go so heavily into Monumental. But, man, it's out there and it's a game that I ideally would like to have. Um, role player Adventures. And this game did something similar to Dice Throne, which is that it took a game that already had certain mechanics. Um, character creation, I think. And it, well, character creation in the case of role player. Dice Throne, uh, Dice Throne it's more, um, you know, just... Yahtzee dice chucking, almost kind of the king of Tokyo, but with ways to use the dice that makes it not just kind of like a, a luck game. So it's kind of figuring out how to um, use the dice that you've rolled. Um, so both of those games took their initial gameplay and then built a narrative campaign element on top of it. You know, Dice Throne to Dice Throne Adventures, which is currently in the production process via its Kickstarter, and um, Role Player has Role Player Adventures. And the, and the Kickstarter comes with 12 different scenario books, 
Each one kind of looks like an old school D&D module. And that appealed to me as well, you know, and, and the whole narrative thing just appeals to me. I like the idea that I can take my characters and build them in one game and then kind of import them and play a campaign with them and try to do like new and interesting things with them. And it also comes with preset characters if you don't have the other games and you don't have anything to import and you just want to play role play adventures, you can use their presets. Again, narrative, campaign, um, it's just, it's right up my alley. It's also uh, Keith from Tejka, I hope I'm pronouncing that right, is the designer and he's done a bunch of stuff that have kind of been on my radar. He did Herbaceous, Herbaceous Sprouts. Um, he did Skull Hollow. I think, I think he did Skull Hollow and he's done some other things. So he was kind of a designer that I was aware of and I wanted to get, I wanted to go to his party. And this is the game that I decided to go to his party with. Next up is Shelfie Stacker. Now, Shelfie Stacker didn't back this one. It's a lighter game. Something about those chunky dice, though, is just so appealing to me. It has really, really chunky dice. Um, however, it's another game where you're not actually rolling the dice. The dice um, get selected and then used and placed. And it's um, a very board game collector meta game because you're actually building a shelf of board games. That's the theme of this game. And it's, it's again, it's a set collection thing. It's kind of like Azul, which we talked about. Um, it's, Excavation Earth has a similar scoring for part of it. But you're building a kind of grid, and you're scoring points off of that grid. And in Shelfie Stacker, you're building columns of games, and each column has to be the same color. And then each die that you're placing on top has to have more uh, more pips on it than the ones below, which actually is a terrible way to stack your games because you don't want your games to be, you don't want to have four games on the top and one game on the bottom, but for the point of the, this game, that's how the scoring works. And then at the end, you'll score points for you know how high each shelf is. Um, you'll score, score points for the top die on each column, how many pips it has. You'll score... Uh, well, the color thing is more of just a placement rule. But that's what it is. It's a set collection game. It's a placement game. It looks gorgeous. And um, Shem Phillips, the designer of this game, has done the Of the North Sea and the Of the West Kingdom games. But he is not, he's choosing not to uh, put out this game through his company. It's coming through a different company. Um, and I think it's just because it's, a much lighter, much simpler game. And so he's just kind of selling it through a different company. But it looks really neat. I love to play it. Terraforming Mars, big box, and 3D tiles. So I backed Merchants of the Dark Road, I backed Role Player Adventures, and I backed Terraforming Mars. And Terraforming Mars, it's a little interesting, right? Because they got so much they got slammed early on for how poor the, the, the production quality of their game was. They had this huge, elaborate, kind of heavy game with all these different kind of expansions that you could add on and add variability to the gameplay. But a lot of gamers didn't like the card art or the way it wasn't kind of uniform. You know, you'd have some art that was drawn, you'd have some art that was kind of photo stock. The game is so good though, it doesn't really matter. Um, some of the cards were thin too, like thin cards, but. This is a kind of a game, and I'm not a always sleever, but for a deck builder or a game where you're really using the cards over and over and over, like you need to sleeve the cards. So for Terraforming Mars, I'm thinking you're gonna sleeve them anyway, so it doesn't really matter. Just throw those cheap cards inside the sleeves and you're fine. Um, but Stronghold had been dealing with this, you know, Terraforming Mars having not the greatest production value. And then they did their Turmoil Kickstarter, which was their first Kickstarter for Terraforming Mars. And they used that to also um, offer first-party dual-layer player boards. Now, for Terraforming Mars, this is really important because the dual-layer boards, you have a lot of cubes in the game. You put them on your mat. You might have, I don't know, 30 cubes on your player mat. If someone bumps the table or someone walks by and hits them, they could go everywhere. And this also is uh, an issue for a, a game called Eclipse, which, which I also love. So for Terraforming Mars, it was always my thought, man, I really want to get that game. But if I get that game, I need to have dual layered player boards so that the cubes 
don't go flying. And I didn't really want to, you know, pay some expensive third party solution. But when Stronghold did their, uh, their Kickstarter for Turmoil, they offered first player, I mean, first party dual layered player boards. So I was like, man, I'm in. So I pledged that campaign, I got everything. And so now they put out this big box solution, storage solution, plus the 3D tiles. You can really sort of like, you know, increase the quality level of your game with these gorgeous tiles. And I think I don't have a 3D printer. And again, it was like, do I want to, you know, kind of cobble together third party 3D printed tiles to really, you know, pimp out my game and make it look that much more spectacular? It's just easier for me to just kind of do it first party, all in one package, boom. So this was fairly easy for me. It was a fairly easy decision for me. The only thing that I really didn't want to pledge in this uh, Kickstarter and I didn't were the metal cubes. They There are some cubes that come in the game for certain resources that kind of have a metal finish on them. I've heard that, they can, that that metal finish can rub off. Um, so with this iteration, with this Kickstarter, they're giving you like solid metal cubes, but because they're solid metal cubes, it's like 60 bucks just for the cubes as an add on. So I said no to that. Uh, lastly, and this is kind of an, another entry in the very cool, very well produced, great components, light set collection is, uh, the whatnot cabinet and the whatnot cabinet interestingly enough, was also designed by Keith Matajka with Steve Finn and uh, uh, Eduardo Baroff. And together, the three of them have designed the uh, Herbaceous Herbaceous Sprouts and um, what was the third game? Uh, Sunset Over Water. And all well-regarded games. No games that I had. Um, if I was jumping on, if I was looking for another game, um, if I didn't have, as we've talked about, Azul and Cat Lady and all that, Whatnot Cabin might be something that I would jump at. It's it's a cheaper game. Um, it's a lighter game. It's easy to teach, quick to get to the table. It has art um, from, I think, Kim Robinson, I think, is one of the artist names, but she hasn't done too much. But then Beth Sobel, who is great, fantastic artist. She's done uh, Viticulture, Wingspan, Arboretum. She's like a huge selling point to me for a game like that. And the Whatnot Cabin, the theme behind this one is you're kind of walking out on the beach and you're finding various found items on the beach, whether that's, you know, shells or pieces of like antiques or arts, you know, maybe some broken pottery, things like that. And you're drafting them. And again, you're putting them in kind of a grid and then they score uh, and, and set collection ways based on different arrangements. Um, that looked great, but I like I didn't need to back, you know, canopy, and the whatnot cabinet and shelfie stacker and Merchants of the Dark Road even uses a little bit of that. Like I didn't need to back all of them, but they all looked really really good, really well made games and games that, uh, as you know, a potential buyer you should definitely be aware of because one of them at least one of them should be for you these are all really, really nice games okay so let's talk about the games that are coming out in july the first one is ascension tactics now ascension is a deck builder uh that came out following dominion and was one of, I think, the two, I think those were the two very popular deck builders of their time when they were out. And I liked Ascension. I thought it looked really neat. Um, you were you know, building your hand, deck building, and then fighting uh, monsters. It was not particularly complex, but I liked the idea. I liked the way it was laid out. I even liked the card art, although the card art took a big knock for the first game, maybe the first two games. Um, and then they put out a ton of expansions and it's been, I think it's been 10 years now. I think it premiered in uh, 2010 and it's had a, a huge number of expansions. Some of them have been collected into these tin boxes. So they're kind of like more 
uh, collected bigger expansions. So there's a lot of gameplay in expansion right now if you just want to go out and buy all the Ascension stuff that's been published to date. But uh, this month, Ascension Tactics is being launched, and it takes the old Ascension deck builder and adds miniatures and tactical gameplay to it on a, you know, a modular board. Um, so you're using the deck building cards not only uh, for you know, defense and attack value and to obtain more cards and defeat monsters, but you're actually using them to move around miniatures on the board. There's four different game modes. There's PvP, Solo, Cooperative, and Campaign. And within each of those four types of gameplay, there are different scenarios with different um, winning conditions. So, you know, one winning condition might be to eliminate a certain number of enemies on the map. One might be to be in a certain position on the map surrounding, um, you know, some object on the map. It's got some variability to it. I don't think it's something that I'm going to back just because I've already kind of heavily invested in Thunderstone Quest and Aeon's End, which are two uh, deck builders that launched later after Ascension. And I think they kind of took a lot of the basic Ascension gameplay and added to it and built on it. And I really like both of those games, Thunderstone Quest and Aeon's End. And I like all of their additional mechanics and kind of how they've evolved the genre and what they've added to it. So I don't think I'm going to go back and back uh, Ascension uh, uh, tactics. But for the right person who's not already, you know, kind of heavily invested in a deck builder, and maybe for someone who really likes skirmish gameplays and, you know, miniatures, it could be, a, it could be the game for you. You know, it could take a, a solid deck building base game and then add on these additional mechanics on top of it. So if that's something that appeals to you, I'd give it a hard look. Dead Reckoning is the next game from John D. Clare. And I talked earlier in this video about Mystic Veil vale and Edge of Darkness. So Dead Reckoning is pirate themed. It's also a 4X game. And it takes those same card crafting uh, mechanics that John has been building on for the last several games. Well, the last two games, but Mystic Veil vale has had a ton of expansions. And it adds yet more mechanics and a new theme to it. I believe Dead Reckoning is also sp supposed to be very kind of sandboxy. He also has a new evolution of uh, the Dice Tower mechanic, which he used that in Edge of Darkness. Mm, that was something he brought in um, where Mystic Veil vale originally had had this uh, card crafting mechanic, and it was all about creating the cards. So once you finished creating these cards, you scored for points, and that was essentially the end of the game. And I mentioned before how I kind of wanted something more to the gameplay than that. I wanted to build the cards and then use them. And I wanted the game to kind of begin with crafting the cards and then have those cards be used mechanically you know, in different ways. That's what Edge of Darkness did. And one of the camp mechanics that Edge of Darkness added was this dice tower. And it determined how some of the enemies attacked the players and how they occupied the, the board game space. Now, for Dead Reckoning, he's come up with a interesting kind of little dice tower-esque mechanic. Uh, there's a ship that's built out of cardboard, and then it spits out the dice along this kind of, this kind of like waves and shoals. And it, they, they spread out <laughs> as they roll. And uh, this dice tower is used, I think, exclusively for combat. So when you're fighting, you'll be throwing these cubes on the ship. They'll kind of you know, roll out onto the waves, and there are all these symbols and iconography on the waves. And where those cubes land will determine how the combat is affected. Everything about Dead Reckoning to me looks uh, neat and fun. And he's already got, if you back at the legendary pledge level, he's got uh, a saga, which is sort of a campaign element. And I'm assuming that's the first uh, campaign module for this game. Now, 
because there is a lot going on in Dead Reckoning uh, production-wise as well, it's, it's a big game. It's got a lot of components. Uh, it's not going to be cheap to produce. It is going to be Kickstarter only. So this is one of, let's see, one, two, this is one of two, well, three. One of my games that I'm talking to you about is not a Kickstarter release in July. It's through a publisher's website. But I'm excited enough about it, and I didn't want people to miss it just because it wasn't on Kickstarter that I'm including it in this section. And we'll get to that in a minute, but that game is Fort by Leader Games. Um, but my, my point with, with Dead Reckoning is that um, I'm, it's one of uh, three games that I'm backing in July. And it's going to be uh, Kickstarter exclusive. So it's not going to be available in retail at all. So I imagine with this one uh, campaign module that's coming out alongside the base game, that that will be expanded on in future Kickstarters. I believe that this game is going to do well. I believe it's going to be a popular game. And I believe that there will be future Kickstarters. Now, they'll probably be smaller because if they put out even several of these little uh, campaign-y boxes, I'm not sure if they're legacy, but they're at least campaign -y boxes, uh, it won't be as big of a Kickstarter as, as the base game. Of course, they'll need to be offering the base game along with future Kickstarters since you won't be able to get it at retail. So I'm, I'm excited about that. I'm looking forward to seeing how that first... Uh, little campaign box plays and then where they go from there in the future. Next up is Fort, which I just mentioned. And this game is not on Kickstarter. It's directly, it's available directly through Leader Games' uh, website. Launched July 21st, I think. And it's, a, it's just a pre-order. The game's $30. If you're in the United States, I'm not sure if you can order it outside of the United States, but if you're in the United States, it's $10 for shipping. So it's $40 total. And that will get you the entire game. Um, and it, they're going to start shipping on August 3rd. So it's a, it's a quick turnaround. The game's obviously already in production. And uh, you're not going to have to wait for this one for you know a year, as with most Kickstarters. As I said, it's not a Kickstarter. It's a, it's a pre-order. And if you're familiar with Kyle Farron's art, who did uh, Root, and he's also doing leader games now in production Kickstarter from a few months ago, Oath. It's the same artist. Uh, he, it's, he's got great art. It's really colorful. It evokes these the characters in Root, the birds and the cats and the raccoons you're playing with. Um, it just it makes a very cute woodland you know animated theme for what is essentially a war game. And for same art. Different designers. The designers of for this is their first uh, big game, and it's themed around kids, uh, kids building forts and eating pizza, <laughs> and it looks it looks pretty neat to me. It looks very similar to Root in gameplay, but it's not asymmetric in the same way that Root is. In Root, every player has a different faction, and every faction plays differently. So each time you're playing a new faction, you have to learn an entire set of mechanics, which can make teaching it and getting it to the table kind of difficult. Um, you need to have players who are willing to you know, spend time learning the game and learning these different factions, and not everyone wants to do that. Some people just want to sit down and play. So Fort would then be the game for them, because everybody's you know, playing with a similar faction, and... You know, while it does have you know card mechanics and different iconography that allows you to activate abilities in different ways, all the factions are, I think, the same, if not the same, very similar. So it's not this kind of thing like with Root or with Vast, where every faction is very, very, very different. And in that sense, it's going to be more of a medium, medium light game. And I think it looks really neat. I'm very excited about it. I think it'll be a great game to play with my fiance Kristen and you know sort of introduce her to leader games and stuff Kyle Farron's um, art and then hopefully she'll be excited about it and from there we can play Root and then eventually Oath when that shows up but um, Fort on its own looks really like a lot of fun.
Massive Darkness 2.0. This is something I don't think I will be backing because I think it's going to be massive. And um, if you're not, well, <laughs> of course it's going to be massive. It's Massive Darkness. But if you're not familiar with the original Massive Darkness, it is a Simon Games release. And it took a lot of the theming and excitement of Zombicide. Uh, and those games are very kind of, you know, I hear them described often as beer and pretzels games because it doesn't, they don't take a lot of thought. They're just kind of mindless dice chuckers. Um, I mean, there are different mechanics and there's combat and there's things you're, that you're managing, but it's not a fry your brain, thinky, heavy game. You're just kind of having fun and rolling dice and hacking and slashing things. And uh, Massive Darkness took that experience and then grafted dungeon crawling onto it. So there's more going on with it than there is with Zombicide. Now, the one negative, I guess, that I have heard about Massive Darkness is that it's not that well balanced of a game. I've heard that as you play Massive Darkness in the beginning when you're starting your campaign, um, it's, it's very difficult. You're starting out with kind of a, an imbalance. Everything's hard to kill. Um, it's very, very hard to stay alive. But then the more you play the game, by the end of the campaign, you're just going through and slaughtering everything. And that can often be the case in video games and even some board games where there's a little bit of a barrier to entry. Your first few fights are difficult. And then as you level up and you gain more abilities and weapons and armor and all these things, at the very end of the you know, the game, your reward is that the game gets easier. But I think this imbalance in Massive Darkness 1.0 was to a fault. So when 2.0 hits Kickstarter, which is supposed to be in July, although we're we're now getting into the end uh, third and half and third of July, um, I'm, so I'm not sure if it's going to actually make it as a July launch. But when it does hit, I'll be looking specifically at that how well is the gameplay balanced is it you know not so crushingly difficult at the beginning of the campaign and then kind of ridiculously easy at the end if it's really if it's well balanced and there's been a change since uh, massive darkness 1.0 i will definitely consider backing it but like a lot of simon games if they are doing this model where they're adding on just a ton of content and they're starting maybe from 1.0 and duplicating all that content, because I don't know if they're going to be, you know, starting over simply and maybe putting out a base game with a, a small expansion or two, if they're going to try to front load it with all this stuff. So if it is front loaded with all that stuff, I'll probably have to pass on it because I don't think as interested as I may be in sort of, entering the Zombicide uh, related space for the first time in my collection, I don't think I want to go, you know, into a hundreds of dollars pledge to do that. And I am sort of a completist. And so if there's a lot of content available, I probably, I'm just not the kind of person who wants to get, you know, just the base game. I want to get all this stuff. I suppose I could consider, you know, getting the base game just the base game in this campaign with the idea that if it does well and they do another one later, I can pick up kind of the additional stuff with that later campaign. But that's a lot of maybes. And I could also just pick everything up in a future campaign if that were to happen. So I think for me, that one will be a wait and see, but it will be partly dependent on how good the campaign looks and how well the game has been rebalanced. Monsters on Board was originally supposed to launch in June, but it's being put out by Final Frontier Games. And Final Frontier Games is in the middle of production on Merchant's Cove, their previous Kickstarter. Uh, they also did Rise to Nobility, um, Cavern Tavern, and I like their sensibility as a games company. They do a lot of work with the Miko. So the Miko did uh, Raiders of the North Sea, Explorers of the North Sea, Shipwrights of the North Sea. He's also done all of the West Kingdom games. He, I like his art. He's one of my favorite artists working out there. 
and his art on the game immediately makes me want to back it, which I can't always do because he's he's becoming fairly prolific. He's doing a lot of art. And uh, so Monsters on Board has my attention because of the Miko. And I'm going to need to look at it a little closer when it comes out. I think it's going to be lighter than some of their recent games. Um, it's got dice movement, which is I'm curious to see how that works, and drafting. And those are two things that could be fun in a lighter game. So I'm still open to it. Final Frontier is working to complete production on Merchant's Cove. Right now, as, as I'm recording this video. And it took more time and effort than I think they originally anticipated because um, throughout the campaign, they added all these uh, additional expansions. And each expansion functions as a, another mini game. So they have all these kind of different mechanics. And it looks really, really, really neat. The fact that you can add on all these different things and everything kind of functions differently. But it meant that they were kind of making one big game with four or five additional mini games. Because of that, and because they didn't want to kind of still be you know, knee deep in producing Merchant's Cove while they were also launching Monsters on Board, Monsters on Board has gotten pushed. Uh, again, we're nearing the end of July, so I'm not sure if it's going to make it out in July. It may end up getting pushed again into August. But it's going to have really neat art by the Miko. It's going to be monster themed. And so if someone's looking for a lighter game, maybe for younger kids who are into, you know, Frankenstein and vampire, like cartoony type versions, um, it seems like it'll be a, a great game. And I'm, I'm, I'm even going to be taking a look at this one. Now, there's another game by the Miko that was also pushed to July that also is not out yet. So it may be pushed back to uh, August, and that game is Plunderous. And Plunderous um, initially caught my interest, again, because of the Miko, but it's also steampunk themed. And the Miko with steampunk art just is something that seems so appealing. And you know, he does a lot of, I mean, he's done a lot of fantasy stuff. Um, he did all those Garpel games that I just mentioned in talking about Monsters on Board. But he also uh, has done all the the Valeria games. Uh, so a lot of it's very fantasy themed. Um, and so I'm, I'm interested, interested to see him bringing his characters and his art style to a different theme. And I think the steampunk stuff should look really, really cool. Um, it's also got a sort of interesting group of mechanics. It's got area control, it's got hand management, um, it's got resource management, dice manipulation, and negotiation. So all of those mechanics except negotiation are, in my mind, kind of um, often grouped together. And I, I mean, I definitely will be interested to see how the dice manipulation goes with the hand uh, management and the area control. But throwing a negotiation in there as well, you know, kind of changes it up and makes the overall gameplay something that uh, I need to see more of because I'm not quite sure how those things are all going to work together. But I'm really, really interested. And, you know, it could go one way and have me dying to back it or it could go another way and have me being mm, a little more meh and lukewarm on it. Um, but I'm definitely, it's on my radar, and I'm going to be looking at that the day that it hits. Now, I'm, I've been doing all these lists in alphabetical order, but because I took the Miko branch from Monsters on Board to Plunderous, I have to backtrack a little bit. So we're going to pop backwards to the Night Cage. Now, the Night Cage initially had me very interested because it's a cooperative uh, horror-themed tile placement game. And... It looks neat, it does look neat, and I think for some people, um, it's a game you're, you're definitely gonna wanna back. But it's a little lighter than I initially thought it was gonna be. I think after taking um, a deeper look at the gameplay, it reminds me a little bit of you know, something like uh, Forbidden Island, you know, the Forbidden Island series, Forbidden Desert. 
So how this is different is uh, thematically each character, each player is playing a character who's kind of thrown into this dungeon uh, network. And it's kind of, um, it's a cave network. And everyone has candles. So they can only see as far as a candle uh, would be able to cast light. So if you're on one tile, you basically can see the orthogonally adjacent tiles to you, meaning the ones that are, you know, you, to either side, up or down. So not the, not the tiles that are on your diagonals. And as you move, you lose candlelight access to the tiles that you're moving away from. So what will happen is those tiles will actually come off the board and you'll you put new tiles into the space you're moving into and the tiles surrounding those. So it means that as you play the game and as you move around, and you're going to have you know a group of two to four players in different areas of the board, and as each of those players is moving, those tiles that they're moving away from will come off the board and go away. So some of the puzzle of the game is not to move away from tiles that you need. <laughs> You need to make sure you go there and collect the things um, before you move away from them. I suppose in certain instances, if you you know you move in such such a way that you reveal you know two tiles on opposite sides of you, and then you have to move to collect an item in one direction, you're going to lose the tile in the other direction. So there's going to be um, a management of actions in that sense, and and how to kind of execute that to try to get, because you're going to need to get, I think it's four keys, at least for the, the basic games. Uh, and then all the players will need to converge back to a gate, having these keys to be able to get out. And I'm, I haven't looked deeply enough into the gameplay to know if the gate goes away. It may need to be a case, at least in some of the variants, where you need to have a player remaining by the gate. Because again, what happens if a player moves away from that exit gate and then the exit gate tile vanishes? Now I'm assuming the exit gate tile will stay, but I don't know that for sure. Um, anyway, as I've looked more at the, the gameplay in the Night Cage and seen how kind of simple it is, I don't know that it's the game for me. I actually do own uh, Forbidden Desert, which I probably would like to get rid of at this point because I have many other co-op games that are more involved and better for my liking, uh, better to my liking. And I don't really ever see myself going back to Forbidden... Uh, let's see, what do I have? It's Forbidden Island. <laughs> I just had to look across the room. It's Forbidden Island that I own. So I don't really see myself uh, pulling that one back out. I think it's kind of been left behind as too light of a game. Um, which means I probably won't be backing the night cage either. But for you know lighter gamers or you know people who are looking more for casual games and family friendly games, and want a theme that's focused more on sort of black and white art and this kind of horror theme, I think it's a neat option. You know, it's it's something that I would definitely consider um, adding to my collection in place of a Forbidden Desert or Forbidden Island. So if you're in that category of gamer, um, definitely you should give it a look because it does look pretty interesting. Now, this is another game that I actually am backing this month and it's called, um, well, it's either called Perseverance or Perseverance. I'm not sure how they're pronouncing it, but let's call it Perseverance Castaway Chronicles. And this one is one of the games I'm most excited about in a multi-month period. Let's say in the first six months of 2020, this is, well, I can't even say that because July, July isn't in the first six month period. So let's say in the, in the summer. This is one of the Kickstarters I'm most excited about launching this summer. And the reason for that is that it's from the Mind Clash team. And the Mind Clash team have become my favorite designers my favorite board game designers on the planet. Um, they also made Tracarian, Anachrony, and uh, Cerebria. And those are three of my favorite games of all time. 
I think if you were to take their work and Vital Lacerda's games, I would be almost okay just having those designers' games and nothing else. Um, if, if I only had those games to play for the rest of my board gaming life, I'd be pretty okay with that. Um, and Mind Clash also has just off the charts uh, quality on their on their components and their graphic design, their card art. Their games are so pretty. They're gorgeous. They really are kind of the epitome of high-end board gaming, both in the production quality and in the design. Now, their games are usually very heavy, which, you know, is, I don't want to say it's a barrier to entry for some people, because for some people it goes beyond that. They just don't want to play it. It's too heavy, which is a shame because these games are so well designed and so gorgeous. I, I, I think everybody should play them. So if they're not for you now, maybe the longer you're in this hobby, there's something you may want to come back to. The more you get familiar with different kinds of uh, mechanics and different kinds of games, maybe that's something you can work your way up to. Um, but they're, they're my favorite games, and the production is amazing. I think the only thing that really uh, sits on the same level of quality with Mind Clash are uh, Orange Nebula, who put out Vindication, which, you know, there's different feelings on Vindication, but I think everyone thinks it's a gorgeous-looking game. And then Orange Nebula also has Unsettled in production right now, which not only looks gorgeous, um, but the way that they've kind of designed Unsettled, uh, the gameplay to kind of work around different expansion boxes. It's a, it's a space exploration game, and there are different boxes for different planets. So when you play the game, you're gonna be selecting different of the planet modules. And all of the planet modules are going to be you know, very different in terms of the, the terrain and mechanics and things like that. Um, but I'm just, uh, Orange Nebula is also fantastic. Um, Chip Theory Games, who does Too Many Bones and Cloud Spire, they have amazing component quality. Um, and, and all of these, all of these companies also have uh, what I think is just great design as well. Um, and Eagle Griffin, who does um, the Lacerda games and Age of Steam. Although I know there were a few problems with some of the Age of Steam maps in the last Kickstarter. But, but that said, I think in general, uh, Eagle Griffin is a great publisher who produces some of the best looking games on the market and works with really good designers. So... That whole, I know I'm supposed to be talking about Perseverance Castaway Chronicles, but I'm just trying to tell you the the group that I put this in, the kind of standard that I, I hold Mind Clash to, which is the cream of the cream. And Perseverance Castaway Chronicles looks like no exception. Now, it actually looks a little lighter than some of their other games, and um, not that light. It's still got all of the, the mind clashy Euro goodness to it. But it's also a narrative game, or rather a series of games that when played together can form a narrative campaign. So the way they're doing this, they have the Kickstarter out right now, and it's for the first two games in the series. Now, both of these games are standalone games. So you could play the second game uh, just by itself, and have a great time. You could put the first game by itself and have a great time. And the plan is later, I'm not sure when, could be six months, could be a year, who knows, they will do another Kickstarter, I believe for the remaining two episodes, three and four, but I'm not sure they could do, you know, they could do um, a Kickstarter for the third and then later do a Kickstarter for the fourth. But the plan is to have four games in total. And each of these games is gonna be just a fantastic Mind Clash production that can be played standalone. But then when you have all four of them uh, and you play them together, you can have your characters go on a journey from game to game. And as someone who likes you know, heavy Euro-y goodness and also someone who loves campaign games, this is so much in my sweet spot that this was just... You know, if I backed one game, 
I think in, a, in this six month period, it probably would be this game. So I'm, I'm super excited. And I know that the first two games feature dinosaurs. I'm not sure how that's going to evolve in the future games, if the dinosaurs will be phased out or if there'll be a, um, a factor that you know plays in all four games. There are also, there's two different pledge levels. One includes dinosaur miniatures and one I think that just has standees. So if you want to get on in on the uh, cheaper version, you can just go for the standees. I will say if you have ever played Anachrony and you've used the miniatures in Anachrony, they're completely superficial miniatures. They add nothing to the game mechanically, but they are gorgeous miniatures. And uh, Anachrony is a worker placement game. And if you don't have the miniatures, you're using these little cardboard tiles, I guess, that are your workers. If you do have the miniatures, there are little slots in the top of the miniatures. Now the miniatures look, are kind of like spacesuits. So you can slot the little cardboards and place them in the top of the miniature. And so you have you still have your cardboard worker with, with the worker's face, but this little cardboard worker face is now in this great miniature spacesuit. And even though it's a completely you know, superficial add-on, I would never want to play Anachrony without it just because they're they're, they're great miniatures. They're, they add so much to the gameplay, um, even though they don't do anything mechanically. And so for me, with the, something like Perseverance Castaway Chronicles, I'm in for the dinosaurs completely. Like, I, I trust Mind Clash. Um, they're, they're a company where I'm just, if they do something new, I'm give me, you know, here's my money, give me your stuff. And um, the, the two main... Mind Clash designers, um, Victor, uh, Peter, and Richard Amon are also working on this. Uh, David Turksey, who does a lot of their solo stuff, and also um, worked on, I think he worked on Cerebria and Anachrony, but not Tricarian. I think Tricarian had been originally produced before he kind of, you know, joined associating with their team. Um... So he wasn't in on the design, uh, the design work for Tricarian, but uh, I, I really like David Turksey in general, and so he's. I'm happy that he's kind of also working on Perseverance, and there are I think three other designers working on it as well. Um, Wolf Plank, uh, Anthony Haugigo, I think his name is, and then. Um, do I know? I don't know the name of the final designer. I know he has three names, but I can't remember. So I apologize to you, Thomas Van something. <laughs> but I'm buying your game. So hopefully you can uh, take my money to the bank. Okay. Um, we've already talked about Plunderous, so alphabetically I'm going to jump back over that one and land on The Shivers. The Shivers is another game that I was initially very excited about. And the reason for that is the production um, quality, I guess, of the game and mechanically what's happening with the game. And that is that The Shivers um, utilizes what are essentially pop-up books in their gameplay. I mean, they're not books so much. They're kind of these uh, tiles that, you know, I guess you take it out of the um, housing and then you flip open the tile and it's um, got a pop-up book-like setting on the tile and each of these tiles is a different room in a mansion I think and you can kind of construct the the setting and the specific layout of the house uh, based on the scenario by kind of interlocking different different pop-up tiles and I think they have like a magnetic connections you kind of snap them together and I mean it looks amazing it looks like nothing we've really seen in the in the board game world before which is why I was so excited about it now I don't I'm not going to be backing this one and the reason is that it's it's as I've looked into the gameplay it's very very light simple gameplay um, to the point where you're you're looking at these tiles you can do a few things sometimes with the tiles like uh 
and you can go in and open a little oven door. Maybe if it's a kitchen tile, maybe there's something in the oven, a loaf of bread baking, or there may be different cabinets that you can open up. And I know players have dry erase uh, boards and they can write down things that they see on the tiles that may or may not be important. And then as they you know, move on to other rooms and they're you know, solving the scenario, whatever that may be, choices that they make may be affected by what they've written down. Um, I just want to, I want a heavier game, I guess, that's designed with this design. Um, something that has like kind of meatier, more involved gameplay. So I don't think this is going to be the game for me, but damn, it looks really, really cool. And I think if you have, you know, little kids or this kind of like very light gameplay is something that is up your alley, then you totally should look at this and probably back it because it's just, it's unlike anything else out there. And I mean, if I had little kids and I was, you know, breaking up this game for them, I just, I can only imagine the, the looks on their faces and the wows that, that this would elicit. Um, if you're, you know, a seven-year-old kid, this would be amazing. The last game I'd like to talk about uh, with a Kickstarter launching in July is called Tokyo Series Expansions, which is um, two expansions uh, created by Jordan Draper for games that he's made previously. Now, those two games are Tokyo Tsukiji Market and Tokyo Metro. Tokyo Tsukiji Market is an economic game that has to do with um, buying and selling fish. And there are, a whole, there are a lot of mechanics in this, in, in his, his first game. I mean, in, there, there are a lot of mechanics in Tokyo Tsukiji Market. Um, and then the other game is Tokyo Metro, which is sort of a train game. So this Kickstarter has an expansion for each of those games. And you can either back one expansion, you know, like let's say you had one of those previous games, you could pick up just the expansion for that game. You could pick up both expansions bundled together. You could pick up a base game with its expansion, or you could pick up both base games and both expansions. And uh, I got my feet wet, let's say, uh, with Jordan Draper games by backing his import-export um, about a year ago now, I think, and that's set to ship soonish. So for now, I don't, I don't think I'm going to back this one. I'm kind of holding off. I want to uh, see what my experience is with import export before I order anything else from him. But if you do not have any Jordan Draper games and you're in the same position that I was when import export came out, I think this would also be a great place uh, for you to begin your um, your entry into the world of Jordan Draper. Um, so you, as I said, you can either, you know, back one base game, uh, with its expansion or the other one or both expansions or everything. And the two new expansions, one's called, uh, Osaka Metro, which is the expansion to Tokyo Metro. And I know that game gives you a new map, um, some different cards and things. So it sort of changes the gameplay around. And the one for the, uh, the market one adds in, I think, ship rentals and a whole bunch of you know, different, different uh, mechanics. So but when you boil it down, one's sort of an economic, you know, buying and selling, trading, negotiation game. The other one's uh, a train game. But they do have, you kind of can't pigeonhole either one so succinctly, like they're this kind of very interesting, very unique assortment of mechanics. And they also component-wise, because he makes games the way that he does, and he kind of started on his own, and he began kind of hand-making these games, and as he became more and more successful, continued with his style of design and his style of production, he, he is making games that are... Um, very unique to him, um, very much, you know, once you see these, his games, you'll always be able to identify a Jordan Draper game. They're very, they're just very, you know, unique looking. Um, and I think he's 
just uh, you know a creator out there that we should all want to support because he's making uh, great games and he's doing it his way and what more is there in life? <laughs> Tokyo expansions, check it out. Or Tokyo series expansions. The next section of this video is going to focus on games that I received in the previous month. Um, now that includes, let's say, two, two retail releases and six Kickstarters. Um, the first of those is Edge of Darkness, Cliffs of Cold Harbor. And that is an expansion to Edge of Darkness, which I've talked a lot in this video about uh, John D. Clare. And uh, this is a second Kickstarter that was done for Edge of Darkness that adds on you know, some more mechanics, and some more scenarios and things like that. Um, now, I still have yet to get Edge of Darkness to the table for a variety of reasons. One is that it's just a ginormous game with a ginormous box. And I had a lot of things going on in my life when that game arrived. And um, things continued to happen between my engagement and then, you know, COVID and things like that. So I'm not playing big board games uh, live and in person right now. So uh, Edge of Darkness has kind of been sitting to the side. But now that I have this new expansion for it, which is going to make it even bigger, I do need to get it to the table soon to check it out. And I'm very excited to take a look at it. Um, then I have Fuji Koro Deluxe. And I'm really excited about Fuji Koro Deluxe. Uh, it was produced by Game Brewer, who before that did Gugong. And Gugong, I had mixed feelings on early on. I, I had a, an early play of it. And I thought the game was kind of imbalanced, but after that they did a second Kickstarter for it and added in more things. Um, and so I actually did pledge it at that point and I'm really excited to get Gugong and play it. Um, but the one thing I could never deny about Gugong is how pretty it is. The components in Gugong are amazing. Uh, just the cardboard tiles, the way that they're, you know, the, a lot of times they're shaped like a decree and the way that the, the tiles kind of you know, are rounded and uh, the graphic design, it's just off the charts great. It's a beautiful, beautiful looking game. And Fuji Koro Deluxe looks much the same. Gameplay wise, what's happening with Fuji Koro is you are on this, uh, it's a kind of a feudal Japanese game. Um, you're there's a, a volcano that's going to be exploding. And so the first chunk of the game is kind of going around on this board and exploring and accumulating resources and then using those resources to craft things. And the player board has an area set up. Uh, I may have heard it compared to Minecraft. It's got different areas for, you know, like a helmet and a chest piece and shoes. And then as you get different resources, you can craft equipment and gear and things. And it's going to be different from character to character because you're using different resources to craft these things. Each time, um, the different components or the different gear, the gear that you're crafting is going to be different from game to game because it's going to depend on the different items you're using to craft it. And then at a certain point in the game, the volcano starts to erupt and then it's kind of a race to get off of the board. Um, I had a couple friends who I think were not loving the way that the gameplay looked for whatever reason, but I disagree with them. <laughs> I think it looks really, really neat. Um, I think they just wanted something that was a heavier Euro. But I like the idea that, I like the idea of the crafting and the kind of dungeon crawlery aspect to it in the beginning. And then I don't mind the fact that it shifts and kind of become, becomes a race game in the you know last portion of the game, last, I don't know, 20, 25% of the game. Uh, in that sense, it actually reminds me of something like Clank, because Clank is another game where you're going and you're exploring a location, you're getting certain um, resources or you know, rewards and treasures, and then at some point you have to get out. Um, and so Fujikora looks similar 
to that to me. And it also comes in this giant behemoth of a box. And so just looking at that box <laughs> with the gorgeous art makes me really want to <laughs> open it up and, and take a look at this. And uh, I did also get the player mat for it, which is huge. So at some point I need to make a video with game play for it because it's just, it looks gorgeous. Following that, we have Godspeed. And Godspeed has a theme that I am just fascinated by. Um, the original campaign uh, had five different countries that, you know, it was providing components uh, and, and, you know, faction abilities for. And then over the course of the campaign, they opened up five more. So there are now ten countries uh, that come with Godspeed, at least if you got the Kickstarter version. And thematically what's happening in Godspeed is uh, there's a bit in there about the space race being a lie and the fact that we never landed on the moon, but what, we were, what, what countries were actually trying uh, to compete to settle was not the moon, but another planet that I think they reached through a portal, I believe is the explanation. Um, the reason behind that, I mean, on, on one hand, who cares, right? Who cares if you're populating the moon or Mars or another planet? Uh, but the reason for this is that it's a portal to a planet that is light years away. And whatever the technology is that created the portal was one-way technology. So the different representatives from these different countries who have gone to this planet through this portal have embarked on a one-way a one mission. So there's no coming back. So this planet wherever it is, is been populated by uh, different groups from different countries. So you've got the United States, you've got uh, Britain, you've got Japan, you've got China, Germany. Uh, there's 10, as I said, there's 10 countries in total. Um, and essentially, I'm gonna wait for that plane. Uh, there, there are kind of two main deviations in the worker placement mechanic that I think make Godspeed really unique. One is that there is this bidding that happens early on in a round where uh, each country, so each player, has a team of uh, astronauts and scientists and they each have numbers. So you know you may have a captain, you may have a scientist, a tactician, and the numbers are not necessarily the same from faction to faction. So for instance, I could have a captain with a one on it, you could have a captain with a three on it. And in the beginning part of a round, you're, if you choose, bidding with your workers um, in, in the first stage of that gameplay. Uh, and if, you, if everybody bids, everyone's gonna get certain rewards, um, if not everyone bids, then um, players do not get, you know, the full number of rewards for bidding. Sometimes they don't get any rewards, but to not bid also uh, requires a penalty. So you're, you're trying to kind of weigh, do I want to bid on this with a worker that I may need later on in this round to place, to take an action? Or do I want to try to get whatever the rewards are for this beginning bidding phase? And those rewards may be something that you really, really need or want. The, I think it's the king's dilemma. And then later on in that same round, you're going to use workers to take certain actions. And if you used a worker to bid in that, you know, in that bidding phase, that worker will no longer be available to you for the other worker placement phase. On top of that, there's a mechanic where different the different worker space uh, the different worker placement spaces work better with different roles. So if I have a captain or a technician or a scientist, those roles will earn uh, more rewards if I place them in the spaces designed for for that role. So like there'll be a place on the board where if I use my tactician. You know, there's an area that's kind of tactician focused where if I use my tactician in that area, I'm going to get more and or better rewards. If I go just go there with my captain, I may get a lesser reward. 
then there's another area where you know the captain's going to get the better rewards. So thematically, I find the game very, very interesting with this kind of like weird space race alternate, you know, present. I'm not sure when the game is set, alternate present history or future, wherever it's taking place, it's an alternate version of history. Um, I find that interesting along with, with the space exploration element. Um, what is colonization, really, the space colonization element? But I also find the variation on worker placement fascinating. And I like how they've kind of changed the genre. And I like the way they've added this kind of bidding phase. And then they've added this um, element where you're getting different rewards if you're able to send specific worker types to specific areas. So I'm really wanting to get that uh, game to the table soon. Um, it looks looks pretty good to me. When I really started getting into board gaming uh, a couple years ago, I somehow kind of blew by uh, the worker placement genre without playing Lords of Waterdeep. You know, I think I'd played Stone Age and a couple of lighter games, maybe online, and then I got to like Raiders of the North Sea, and before I knew it, I was playing Anachrony, which is a very heavy game. And somehow I just never, I never went back to play Lords of Waterdeep, but I've always heard really, really good things about it. And it ended up being on uh, one of the daily sales from, you know, Game Nerds or Cool Stuff Inc., someplace like that. And so I was able to grab Lords of Waterdeep, the base game, and the expansion uh, Scoundrels of Skullport, very cheap. Um, and I've also been playing Dungeons and Dragons lately with my fiance, Kristen, and we've she's been loving it. So I thought this would be a great chance for me to go back in complexity a bit and you know introduce her somewhat. I think she's played worker placement. Yeah, we have she's played Everdell. Um, so she's played a few worker placement games. But I think it's a, from what I've seen, it's a genre that she really does like. Um, and so it's kind of going to serve a dual purpose of me getting to go back, play a lighter game, and play a game that I think will really appeal to her with a theme that is something that we're also involved in in other ways right now. Another Kickstarter that arrived in June uh, was Pangea. And that is perhaps the Kickstarter I'm most concerned about out of all the Kickstarters that I've backed. Uh, part of it may be my own fault because when I was originally following the campaign, the miniatures looked bigger to me than what eventually showed up in the game. I'm not sure if that was just my imagination or if the sizes of the miniatures had been reduced. So I take full responsibility for that. But um, what had initially sort of attracted to me, uh, attracted me to Pangea was this idea that it takes place, you know, in this prehistoric period and players are playing all these different kind of species and it's your job to evolve your species, which for some species may entail combat or, you know, things that are a little more aggressive or take that. But for other species may, you know, for a plant species may just involve kind of like uh, very little player interaction and more kind of heads down Euro-y um, mechanics. And it's different for different factions in the game. So I thought the, the variability between species was interesting. Um, I've never played dominant species, which I've heard Pangea compared to a little bit. So I don't have a frame of reference for that. However, the end game is something I'm a, I'm a little bit worried about, and I perhaps didn't pay enough attention to it initially during the campaign, which is that at the very end of the game, there's going to be some sort of ca catastrophic event that's going to happen. Um, and it's I think it's different from game to game. So it could be, you know, a comet coming down and hitting the Earth. Um, it could be, I think one of them is gamma rays. So I'm not quite sure how that would work where the gamma rays come from, but there are, I think, four or five different kind of end game scenarios that could happen. When they do, there'll be different regions of the board 
where you cannot have your species. And there will be some areas where you can have a species in that area, but it has to be in a sub area within that area uh, of a certain level where those species can kind of be hiding to wait out whatever the, you know, the, the big event is. So the areas where you may want to end up at the end of the game are going to be different from scenario to scenario. And let's say in, in different um, areas, there could be different levels of sub area where you could hide like a one or two, or I think it's a one or a two, or you could just be in the area itself. And so, you know, one doom scenario may require that you not be in that area at all. Another doom scenario may require that if you're in that area, you have to be in the hiding spot designated as a two or something like that. And I'm just a little worried gameplay wise that whatever happens in, you know, in, in the first 90% of the game may be a little thrown overboard in, in this in this end scenario where you're just trying to get to certain spaces in the board or arrange yourself in certain spaces of the board. I, I haven't played it yet, so my worry may be uh, unfounded, but I, I don't want to see, you know, a, a, like a fairly heavy, complex game have all the work that players are putting into it over the course of the game kind of being thrown out in terms of just like a, a simple area control game at the end. The other thing that's worried me a little bit about Pangea is late, late, late in production, they put out an update saying that the miniatures didn't snap into the bases as they were supposed to, and they're just now going to kind of rest in the base, which defeats the whole purpose of the base, in my opinion. You know, the base is there to you know, mark something easily maybe with your player color and allow you to move it around the board. I don't think anyone wants to be playing a game where you just have a miniature resting in a base that's not, that you kind of have to move both pieces separately because one might fall out. That's just shoddy production value to me. But when this happened, the game was so far into production that it didn't make sense to me to, you know, ask for a refund because at that point you're already going to be paying Kickstarter fees. So I thought, well, I'll just get the game, take a look at it. I can always resell it. And I may end up reselling this game. Certainly, once I take a closer look at it, I will make a video and let you all know what I think. But I do have worries about the, the final production and final state of Pangea on a level that I, I rarely have had about other games that I back. Now, Role Player is a game that I did not own. I'd always been curious about it. I do like Dungeons and Dragons. I like character creation. And here is a game that is all about character creation. Um, I think as with Mystic Veil, vale, I was a little worried that it was too simple of a game. You know, I kind of wanted to create a character and then go do something with the character that I created. And that is why when the most recent Kickstarter came out for Fiends and Familiars, I, I jumped on that one because I was able to get the base game and then along with it get Monsters and Minions and Fiends and Familiar, Familiars, and I also picked up the game that. So now I've got this whole inclusive package with you know all the gameplay in Role Player to date. And as I mentioned before, I also did back the recent Role Player Adventures, uh, which makes me extra excited to be able to just kind of see how much gameplay I can get out, out of this IP. And I know that as much fun as I end up having with role player and its expansions, I'll then be able to continue that experience into role player adventures when it eventually shows up. So I'm excited. I'm excited about role player, the role player world. Following that is smartphone. Smartphone is a game. I was a little bit on the fence with smartphone. Um, I think it launched at a time that there were there were several games that looked similar, one of those being It's a Wonderful World, and I ended up passing on It's a Wonderful World, and then I passed again on it when, when they did a later Kickstarter, and I, I, I'm regretting that a little bit. I think I may end up trying to come back to It's a Wonderful World if they ever do a, a new Kickstarter, but at that time, um, 
of, of a few games that look similar, of which It's a Wonderful World was one and Smartphone was another one, the game that I ended up aligning with and backing was Smartphone. And I think part of that was the fact that it was a, a game that had already been produced previously in a European version. So I knew that there was already a functional working version of the game. You know, this wasn't something that was being produced for the very first time, which I think gave me a little more backer's confidence. Um, it, essentially, they were kind of doing a new second version of the game uh, for uh, American audiences. I'm not sure if it's English speaking or more for American or you know the Western world. Um, but I look at it as kind of smartphone 2.0. And in smartphone, players are uh, managing smartphone uh, companies and, and building networks of stores. So I don't have too many economic games, and this definitely has economics in it as you're, you know, you're building a business. And you're also kind of choosing, there are different ways that you can upgrade your cell phone stores, you know, whether you're selling more advanced phones or, you know, you kind of have a more evolved business plan that allows you to, you know, do things with different abilities. Um, there are definitely kind of different strategies that you can take with how you develop and expand your cell phone store. Um, so that was one thing that I liked about it. A second thing is that the gameplay is very much like a like a simple war game. And I talked much earlier in the video about Blitzkrieg and how you're kind of fighting in five different um, arenas at the same time. Essentially, you're doing a similar thing in smartphone where there are a certain number of, you know, kind of countries and regions on the board. And so you're not trying to get, you know, just kind of a majority in any one area, but in, in all these different areas. I like the fact that in um, smartphone, those kinds of pieces and components that you do use in a war game were translated into something for an economic game. So instead of you know, fighting with battleships or planes or attacking someone, there is a similar mechanic that's happening with ways that you are evolving your economic business model. And then the third thing that I thought was pretty neat about smartphone and made it unique is that every round you're dealing with these little cardboard, um, I'm not sure what they're called, but they're, they're kind of a, how you generate your resources. And each player has two of these little cardboard uh, tiles. And each tile is divided, I believe, into six sections. And some number of those sections are going to have iconography on them. So maybe if you have a tile with a six square grid, four of those tiles will have icons on them. And you, in the beginning of each round, you're taking those two tiles and placing one on top of the other. And then you will get resources for all of the black squares that are showing, as well as all of the icons that you've covered. And then later in the round, you will be able to get improvements that you place on these two tiles as you already have them set up, and you, you, can, you can improve on the icons that are showing. Now, what this means is that you are either trying to get a lot of resources at the start of a round by covering up a lot of your icons, or you're trying to have as few icons as covered, uh, as few icons covered as possible, so that later in the round you can upgrade them as much as possible. So every round there's this decision that needs to be made about whether you're choosing a lot of resources at the top or a lot of ability for improvements later on. And I like that kind of uh, meaningful choice. You're trying to make an educated guess about what you may need. I mean, you know if you need the resources, you just don't know how much you may need the improvements. Um, but I, I do like that I guess it's a little bit of a, um, a push your luck mechanic, right? Because you're trying to decide like, well, how tight can I cinch the belt at the top with the resources to you know, open up the possibilities later in the round uh, for more powerful upgrades? 
And those three things together, the kind of war game-like um, structure with different arenas, the kind of economic, euroy planning for your expansion of your network and kind of the way that you're building your engine, really. And then this kind of like unique uh, little kind of resource upgrade you know, division in strategy. All those three things together made the game seem really uh, unique and like something that I wanted to have in my collection. And in general now, I'm, a, I'm at a point where I have a lot of games in my collection, probably too many games. I need to start selling some. So when I do back something at this point or add a new game to my collection, I want it to be something that does something different. Uh, it like shows me a type of gameplay I haven't seen before or evolves gameplay in a new avenue. But I have enough I have enough games that I don't really need more of the same of anything. The last game that we're going to talk about in this section is Whistle Stop. And Whistle Stop I thought looked really neat. Initially I thought that it kind of had a, a look to it in the way that the tiles are assembled uh, as a Suro game or Metro. Uh, you know, where you're kind of placing tiles out that allow you then to move your unit, you know, along these kind of winding tile routes. So I thought it looked neat in that sense. Um, I also found, have found that I'm a huge fan of train games. Now, I do, I do not own Ticket to Ride, but I actually kind of like Ticket to Ride. I like, and it's a simple game. It's a, you know, kind of a beginner intro game. But I like the idea of, you know, just the simple uh, card collection, hand management, and then area control where you're building your trains. It's a great, fun little game. There's a reason that Ticket to Ride is you know, a modern classic and a game that many, many uh, beginning gamers will uh, find and kind of come to. And it's a great game to, to start your board game hobby with. It's so good that I, I don't mind playing Ticket to Ride. But I have found that I really love heavier train games like Railways of the World, Age of Steam. I have not really gotten into 18xx games yet, so that's something I'm looking to down the line. But because I love train games, um, I thought it would be neat to have a train game that I could play with Kristen that is a little lighter on the spectrum. And Whistle Stop definitely was something that I thought could fill that niche. Um, if you are not familiar with Whistle Stop, uh, it's definitely lighter than Age of Steam or Railways of the World. The board is a big kind of outline, and then you place tiles in the middle. And you start on the right side of the board, and you're slowly moving your, uh, your trains from the right to the left side of the board, placing tiles as you continue their journey. Uh, you move your train either using coal resources. You can also do it with whistles, which is, I guess, how the, the game got its name, Whistle Stop. When you're using whistles, you can also actually move your train backward. So if you find that you need to go back for some kind of resource, you know, to the starting side of the board, the right side of the board, you can do that using whistles. If you're just using coal, you can either move uh, from right to left or you can move up and down. Um, and then as you get to tiles further, you know, kind of halfway out to the left side of the board, there are things that can uh, score you score you abilities and give you kind of more resources. Right. You're building an engine as you lay these tiles down. You're collecting resources as you cross the tiles, but you're wanting to get resources that will eventually pay off for the end game scoring tiles that you land on on the left side of the board at the end of the game. So you're trying to kind of manage how you do that. It also has uh, some stocks in the game. I don't think the stocks are as large a mechanical element as they are in Railways of the World and Age of Steam. So again, I think it's a good lighter game to introduce my fiance Kristen to train games with. Also to introduce her to 
you know, the, the stock element within a train game while still having the entire package be a lighter experience. Now, again, I was able to pick up Whistle Stop on a huge sale with a deep discount. And so I was able to pick up that with its Rocky Mountains expansion just all together. So those are the eight games that I added to my collection last month. In the final category for this video, in which we're going to be talking about the last four games, and these are games that are arriving in uh, July. Now, one of them already came, and that is Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. That was the only retail purchase for this month. Uh, I had tried to pick up uh, Gloomhaven when it first hit Target stores, but as I'm sure was the case with many of you, it just, you know, was it would be gone as soon as as soon as a location, a target location acquired it, it just sell it immediately. Um, but luckily enough, I, I did hit a window where I was able to pre-order it. And then a week later, it just shipped to my condo. So I do now have Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion, and that is a candidate for sure for some of these other video uh, categories that I intend on making videos for. You know, I, I think it's a prime candidate for one of these red carpet premiere unboxings, which if I'm going to do that, I probably should do it very soon since there's already a lot of videos out showing off Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion. Um, I could also do a teach, although maybe I don't need to because Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion is so good at slowly presenting the player with its mechanics a little bit at a time, you know, giving you a piece mechanically letting you understand that and play with it and then giving you another piece. And I know everybody seems to have a story with the big monster base game Gloomhaven where they play it for the first time and there are so many mechanics thrown at them and they just die immediately <laughs> in their first combat scenario. Um, and so Gloomhaven Jaws of the Lion is definitely a solution for that. And from what I've read and what I've seen about it, it kind of expertly uh, evolves its own introduction of mechanics. So I'm looking forward, uh, really looking forward to it um, for multiple reasons. One, because I think it's going to be the ideal place for uh, Kristen and I to start playing Gloomhaven, since we have yet to get into the Gloomhaven base game. And... Uh, it should just be a fun and easy way to start the Gloomhaven experience. So certainly that is a candidate for the, the narrative videos. And I would think for those videos, it would be sort of ideal because with the, the scenario book and the way you're, you don't need tiles like you did in the original Gloomhaven. You don't need a lot of huge um, setup and tear down time. Um, it would seem ideal for those narrative play three videos. So the other three games that are arriving in July are all Kickstarters. Now, two of them I don't think qualify for my red carpet premiere videos because as I've said, those are not new to me games. Um, those should only be, those videos should only be for games that are new to the world. And two of those three Kickstarters that are arriving in July are kind of expansion uh, Kickstarters. One was for Eschaton. Um, now, Eschaton is a um, combination deck builder and area control game. It's very similar to Tyrants of the Underdark. I have played Tyrants of the Underdark and I, I really like it. Um, I really like deck building in general. I'd say that's a favorite mechanic of mine. And I do like area control as well. It, it depends on how it's implemented. I don't always love area control games. They need to be, it needs to be a mechanic that's implemented well with other the other mechanics of the game, but I do like the way Tyrants of the Underdark combines those two mechanics. Um, Eschaton is very similar. I think it's similar enough that you probably don't need to have both of the games, but I had a friend kind of sell me on Eschaton. If you have never seen Eschaton, um, it's got very unique art. It's, I don't know if it's black and white, I think it's a little more sepia toned in its black and white um, balance. 
but it's essentially black and white board art, card art, all these things. And I know first off for me that's going to necessitate sleeving because that kind of you know, black card art can often rub off. So I know I'm going to immediately want to put those cards in sleeves. But all of the black and white art on the board and on the cards then makes the kind of pastel colored cubes that you're using for the area control in the game really pop. And it makes the game look really pretty. The other aspect to Eschaton that's kind of unique is the theming behind it. Uh, it has to do with kind of Cthulhu adjacent uh, cultists and the end of the world. In Eschaton, you're combining the deck building and the area control, but you're also doing it thematically to appease the Dark Lord and and take control of, you know, this apocalyptic world and end times. And I just thought that theming looked really unique. So I do have that game showing up uh, in July, and it does have the latest expansion as well, along with the um, cultist meeples. But I don't think it's really ripe for a red carpet premiere since Eschaton, the base game, has existed for several years now. The other Kickstarter I have that's arriving in July is Thunderstone Quest New Horizons, and that's just kind of more stuff. Uh, Thunderstone Quest is a game that I've already been all on board with, so I have the original big box you know, Thunderstone Quest game, and I also have the big box expansion, so I have all of the Thunderstone Quest. So for me, backing the latest uh, Kickstarter was no-brainer. It was a smaller uh, expansion Kickstarter, so it just added on uh, a few more scenarios and, you know, gameplay modules and uh, advancements to mechanics. So it's not, it's not a big Kickstarter. It's not a new game. It's just kind of uh, adding on to what already exists. The last Kickstarter I have arriving in July, which I think would be a good candidate maybe for the Red Carver premiere or the Teach videos, uh, possibly even an impression video, is called Loot of Lima. Now, Loot of Lima, I, I was really fascinated by. It's um, Chad Deshone was behind this Kickstarter, and his company has done... Uh, put out Kickstarters for some board gaming tables, but he's also done a few games like QE, On Tour, and Bytes. And all of those games look pretty. And they're kind of smaller box games. Uh, and Loot of Lima looked neat to me. I mean, the art and the design for it uh, is attractive. But what I... What fascinated me with it was the way it kind of took some older deduction mechanics and evolved those. So I'm sure most gamers have probably at some point in their life played Clue. And when you play Clue, you know, you get the little player sheet where you're, you're marking off all of the things that you're finding are, are not true, right? Um, in that case, it's kind of also similar to Battleship, where you're, you're asking questions and you're, you're finding out, oh, okay, it wasn't Colonel Mustard, right? So you know you can cross off Colonel Mustard. And the key to that kind of deduction game or logic puzzles like you may have played in uh, elementary school are knowing how to find out an answer from a lot of negative answers. You know, so you know if like, there are a certain number of people and you find out a certain number of people didn't commit the murder, you're narrowing down the scope of the people who could have committed the murder. So Loot of Lima takes that, but it gives also gives everybody hidden player boards. I suppose in that sense, it's like it's a little like Battleship. And you also have like a clue deduction sheet um, you have a, a similar player sheet that you're writing on. Um, everyone's playing the same game where they're looking for treasure. And they have these uh, nice little cardboard discs. And you're going around, uh, you know, in the turn order and asking people what they know. 
And as you find answers, you, you can either fill in uh, you know, positives or negatives in your own little hidden player board of, of what you know about where the treasure may be. So it's definitely a lighter game, um, and it's something that I wouldn't really necessarily call it a party game, but I think it can fulfill that sort of like quick to teach, quick to the table, everybody sits around, has fun. So that's going to wrap up things for this monthly update. And if you've made it all the way to the end, I want to thank you very much for your time and your interest. For now, I'd just like to invite people to post comments. You know, please like it. Please subscribe, hit the alarm bell. And I'm going to be shooting to get a new video out once a week for the foreseeable future. Hopefully, eventually, maybe Wednesdays will be the day that these get posted as I sort of refine my production schedule. I do plan over the next month to, we'll do another one of these videos for August. And I think I will get that one out a little earlier in the month than this one is landing. Although it does need to be late, in, late enough in the month that I know all the games that are coming out for August on Kickstarter. So probably around the mid-month um, area, you know, maybe around the 15th of August. Also in August, I'll be doing a campaign playthrough and a teach, and I've already said I'm going to do that for Seven of the Continent. But I'm still a little up in the air about which games I'm going to be featuring on the Impressions Review and uh, which game I'm going to be featuring on the Red Carpet of the Premiere. I think some games that might be ideal for the... Um, the red carpet premiere video are Gloomhaven, Gloomhaven, Jaws of the Lion, Loot of Lima. I think Godspeed might be a good game to do it with as well. Um, or maybe Smartphone. The review impressions video that I'm still unsure of as well, that's a little more open. So please let me hear your thoughts. Let me see your suggestions and we'll take it from there. I hope you enjoyed hearing me talk about 45 different games. I hope that it provided some value for it. Maybe you have a little better idea of some of the games you may or may not want to be backing uh, this July on Kickstarter. And be looking for my next video probably in a week to two weeks' time. Thank you once again, and I look forward to playing a game with you at some point in the future.